Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to this very special World of Warships live stream with me, Mr. Conway, and the many amazing people um, who will be joining us today. This is a very special stream. Um, it's kind of inspired by what we did with the uh, virtual naval parade for the end of World War II in Europe, um, where we did a, a like like a historical Q and A session with uh, the mighty Jingles, Trukinafel, and the Chieftain back then, and of course James D. Hornfisher. And we thought it would be fantastic to bring this to you as a regular series after your feedback was so good. So we are back here. From now on, we will be doing this every last Friday of the month. Um, we named the series Armchair Admirals because I think it's most fitting um, to our commentators. So let's introduce them one by one. Then we'll talk a little bit about the topic that we're going to have and we'll have a good stream. We will be watching, of course, uh, or try to watch, um, chat on uh, Twitch, on YouTube and on Steam. So if you have any questions... Um, hold them for a little bit later in the stream and we will definitely get to talk to them as well. So let's say hello first to uh, my uh, co-host co here at, at Wargaming Headquarters, who is Mr. Tucky. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, let's see how this works, but I think it will be working very nicely. And uh, I think we have a very nice topic for the first, uh, first installment. We will get to it soon. Uh, but most of all, we have uh, awesome ghosts, uh, awesome guests, sorry. <laughs> 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 so, 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 Jingles is old, but he's not. He's not in fact yeah. that old. Um, okay, let's let's. Should we say hello yes. to them? Uh, yes, we shall say hello to them. Okay, so chat. Welcome, please. Uh, the mighty Jingles and Drakinifel. Hello. Hello. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you guys uh, know these upstanding gentlemen, and uh, maybe, maybe, we maybe. have them here today mostly because of their historical knowledge and uh, also practical knowledge. Because uh, we have some questions that are very closely tied to like, actual realities of uh, living on board of a warship, and uh, that's where uh, the mighty jingles will be very helpful. Yep. So, um, in case you don't know these gentlemen, I think it's time we, we should we should let them give give them a minute to introduce themselves, tell them why they're here. Um, I mean, obviously, it's because we threatened them, and uh, what you know, we're going to take away their premium ships. But uh, anyway, let's uh, first let's ask uh, the mighty jingles. Mighty jingles. Hello. Hello. Introduce how are you yourself. doing? Although today I'd like to be known as Hiram J. Jingleburger the Third from the Tennessee Jingleburgers, not to be confused with the Boston Jingleburgers. We don't like to talk about them. Now. Too much? Oh, no, no, I think it's just, I think, <laughs> I, I right think perfectly spot on. <laughs> just the right yes. amount. And I, I love love the hat. Um, you have quite a collection of them. Yeah, right now, I do. You? I do. I've got a World War I uh, British hat. Actually, technically World War II as well, because the white caps were swapped out for black caps in wartime service. I've got this. Uh, I also have the uh, German Navy one and a Russian Navy one. The, in fact, the only one I don't have is the Japanese Navy. I have to work on adding that one to my collection. Yeah, we will have to poke our uh, See, colleagues it's from Japan. It's important to know your stuff, but it's more important to look like you know your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, true words. Okay, so let's uh, say hello to Mr. Drickinefell. Hello. Uh, Jingles, of course, you know, he does YouTube things. He also yeah. can't control the autofocus on his camera. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> yes. So, yeah, hello. I'm Drickinefell. Um curator of the youtube channel of the same name and uh i am now surrounded by lovely pictures and hopefully they're not going to fall off this time <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, did they recently uh like a couple of streams ago i've, I've upgraded oh. the, i've upgraded their hangings since then which is just as well since they're also now in heavy glass frame so if they do fall off there's probably going to be a very loud bang yeah, that would be less than ideal uh funny thing is actually um you probably can't see this but behind a tucky um, because of the camera angle right now, there's a Sean Horst uh, hanging, and you can actually no, you can actually see just above his head. Yep. you can see this little thing. That's actually the corner of the the the, the, the hanging, where it's slowly, probably throughout the stream, going to make its way down till it till it falls off again. again. Yeah, that's um, it's uh, a little bit unfortunate. We, we will have to yeah. replace the tape there. We will probably replace the artwork as well, but. So um, let's talk While a little on the bit. Subject, sorry, of yes. Things hanging on the walls behind people, uh, Drac. Congratulations on your silver YouTube award. Oh, oh yeah, thank absolutely. you. <laughs> I don't. I don't have one of those. No. no Why no. not? Because how come? it's not that you automatically get one when your channel passes a certain number of subscribers. Your channel has to be reviewed, and you have to be approved as somebody that YouTube want to give an award to. 
Apparently. <laughs> I really? don't beat that cry yep. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's that's super rude. Yep. That's harsh. But you're on your way to your golden one, huh? Well so like another four hundred thousand? Another four hundred and well, three hundred and fifty thousand or so another at the rate it's going three or four years and I'll be there. I'll, I'll be <laughs> so turned guys, down from my gold one as well. <laughs> guys, so, so subscribe to Jingles on, on YouTube. Go go. Mm. Yep. Do it now. Um, I'm sure the thousand, two thousand people that are watching are going to help massively. Um, so let's talk a little bit about today's topic, right? So we we were t debating what to, to pick as a topic for our first um, first stream, and we in the end we chose. Well, when I say we chose, I'd like the the <laughs> naval experts that are not me. So everybody else here chose um, to make today's topic the carrier battles of 1942 which yes. were pivotal in deciding uh, the um, well the, the war in the, in the Pacific. So yeah. who, who would like to talk a little bit about uh, the general Taki? Taki, Taki, well, Taki. I, I, I can. Yeah, uh, basically, it's June. Uh, June has two uh, very important uh, dates for the war in the Pacific. It has the Battle of, uh, Battle of the Philippine Sea, or also known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot from 1944 which was around uh, 19 to 20 June. Uh, but more importantly, at the beginning of the month, 4 to 6 June is the anniversary of the Battle of Midway. And uh, I mean, that's uh, at least uh, for me uh, generally more interesting topic because like the 1942, basically both sides were still learning things. Both sides were making a lot of mistakes and the battles are really like more... Uh, more interesting, let's say, because the Philippine Sea that was basically a very clear-cut, one-sided affair, but uh, especially with Midway, the things could have easily gone either way. And basically, it's uh, it was like uh, the climax, at least for the U.S. Navy, of the first uh, half of the war, uh, first half year of the war, when basically the carriers were getting more and more into the spotlight and obviously more into the spotlight for the Japanese as well. And I think we have uh, some quite interesting questions already for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, with regards to this topic, if uh, my esteemed uh, <laughs> co-conspirators have anything to add? Uh, I've been looking forward to talking about it, right? Uh, mostly because of the myths around Midway that have sprung up. Uh, this is in no way meant to take away from the amazing achievement that the US Navy scored at the Battle of Midway. It was a decisive battle that changed the balance of power in the Pacific in America's favor, and Japan never got the initiative back. Um, but it wasn't quite the miracle that we may have been led to believe, for reasons that are completely understandable for, well, 70 years, uh, certainly in the West, it's been seen that way and uh well i don't want to spoil the questions because we're going to address that later on but yes. uh, we'll cover that when we come to it and mr Drakenfell, anything to add um no, well carrier battles are always fun because there's <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot more variables involved mainly through the fact that neither side can actually see the other except by the use of their aircraft in a, in a conventional gun battle, generally you can actually see what you're shooting at. Um, but yeah, when when you look at the carrier battles, as you said, especially in, in 1942, when the US and Japanese navies are finding their feet as to exactly how this whole carrier battle thing works, there, there's so many additional variables and kind of what ifs and well, what if this had happened, but should they have done that? There, there, it's just so much more yep. open to question compared to a, a gun line fight. Yeah, the, for the aspect you mentioned, there was like uh, basically of all the spotting reports in Battle of Midway, for example, basically none of them uh, had either the correct composition of the spotted force or the correct position or both. Like basically in that time, it was usual for the spotted position to be like 50 miles off either way. So it was uh, like it, there was a tremendous amount of the fog of war and uh, Frankly, it's kind of amazing that uh, basically all strikes, apart from the Hornets, managed to at least find something. <laughs> yeah, I'm luckily not an entire noob on this uh, subject because I have indeed uh, read um, Mr. Hornfish's book, um, which includes, I think, which includes the Battle of Midway. 
Yes, yes. Well, this, uh, this that's is, the yes. Battle of the Philippine Sea. Uh, it is the Battle of the Philippine Sea. It was the Great Mary. Okay, you know, I know, I know something. <laughs> yeah, that's but, fine. but, but I, I mean, if you read that book, you saw how I, basically how hard it was to run yes. carrier operations even after the two years of experience. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. basically at midway, it was with half a year of experience and like, yeah. That's true. So um, we asked you guys in our portal publication to send in some questions. Now, um, I think it's fantastic that you did, but you sent us 350 of them. And uh, <laughs> we can't answer the 350 questions. So I made the three guys pick their favorite ones. Um, so we, we narrowed it down to like 13. So what we're going to do is we'll, we'll talk about those questions, the ones that you sent in. And the reason we do it this way and don't just take the questions from chat, which we'll be doing later, is uh, so that they can actually uh, like like prepare for the questions because some of these things need some research and if you want a quality answer, you know we'll need to give them a little bit of time. So if you next time want to contribute some questions for the sort of main segment, please um, check the um, linked uh, survey in the publication. Um, we're going to be doing a new publication for every stream every month, so you'll be able to find it there. So let's move on to our first question now. Um, and our first question, I have to see you wait for a second until it comes up on the screen here. So it's from Daffy D9X of the old Salty Dogs. <laughs> he added that, so I thought we would <laughs> give the old Salty Dogs a shout out. And his question is, um, touching on what um, Jingle said already, was the US Navy incredibly lucky that day? Example number one, only one I only IGN search planes that could spot the US Navy fleet was very late taking off. Example two, the searching US Navy dive bombers spot the uh, an IGN destroyer heading straight for the IGN fleet. Example number three, the US Navy dive bombers attack unopposed and hit three IGN carriers while the, while the IGN um, was distracted by US Navy torpedo bombers. Um, well, there's a certain amount of luck involved there, but winners make their own luck. <laughs> Example number three, U.S. Navy dive bombers attack unopposed and hit three Japanese carriers while the J Japanese fighters were distracted by U.S. Navy torpedo bombers. Um, yeah, that's a failure of Japanese uh, fighter control, and it's a failure of discipline from the Japanese combat air patrol, which was endemic throughout the Battle of the Midway. Uh, they were constantly abandoning their stations and going off and chasing targets that were no threat, um, chasing off survivors of torpedo bombers attacks who'd already dropped their torpedoes while there were dive bombers circling overhead and coming in and chasing off after fighters which were no threat um and were basically there to tie up the japanese fighters so yeah. mission accomplished um they were constantly trying to get into dogfights with the fighters rather than the actual bombers it was just an overall endemic institutional failure in combat yes. air patrol direction and discipline by the japanese navy and it yeah, didn't yeah. stop at midway yeah, basically the main problem was that there was not really any central control of the combat air patrol. That's Every right, carrier yeah. was sending uh, replacement planes as, as they were coming in to rearm. And basically, while theoretically the fighter groups were assigned altitude levels for, for the combat air patrol, the moment enemy appeared, everyone kind of converged on them, like uh, kind of like an amoeba, like just... Mm. Uh, trying to uh, well trying to score some hits and that leads obviously to uh, to very unorganized uh, unorganized fashion uh, it didn't end actually in with the cab because uh, another symptom of this was uh, when the first uh, strike against the Yorktown was launched from here you the fighters assigned to the strike as escort actually went off uh, hunting for uh, returning dauntlesses like yeah they, they saw ha huh? Enemy plane. I'm I'm gonna get it, and actually the the dauntlesses without fuel and without bombs were kind of nimble, so it didn't really work out for the fighters that well. Yeah. And the, yeah, the primary so. Japanese method of fighter control was the fighters would just look at whichever escorts were firing their anti-aircraft guns, and they would all fly off in that direction because that's where the attack was coming from, as far as they knew. Uh, yeah. It was it was a shambles. It was completely <laughs> disorganized and in complete opposition to the way the US Navy did it because they actually did it properly. Yeah. Yes, a comment and here from chat from Darth Michalek who's saying the US won midway due to superior damage control uh, demonstrated throughout the rest of the war. Without it, Yorktown, um, because of the damage sustained at mm. Coral Sea, wouldn't have been able to take part yeah. in the battle. We, we'll get to actually, we have a damage control question in the mm. pre-recorded questions, so 
We'll get to that uh, in a bit, but uh, let's, let's, let's can yeah. speak and then. Well, yeah, yeah I was just going to say, with regards to luck, there's actually there's t- sort of two parts to it. I think relevant to that example number three, one of which is actually related to Yorktown, which is obviously the Japanese believe that Americans only have two carriers. So if they think, well, we've had one strike come in, here's the second strike, well, why not pile after it? It's the last strike that's going to come in. Yeah. They don't know that there's a third carrier out there. But the other element of the of luck is, um, I don't know if you can put up the, 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 the mad spaghetti map um, <laughs> that we looked at earlier. Yeah. Um, but the other element of luck is, yes, the dive bombers arrive unopposed, but the sheer numbers that arrive. Because if you, when you look at that, you see Yorktown's strike group taking taking a right hand turn much earlier, and then Enterprise's dive bombers going off on their own little mission, off into the middle of nowhere, and the sheer chance of them dub, effectively doubling back and arriving at the same spot at the same time, just in time to to strike, that is probably the single largest element of chance yes. and luck in the entire battle. Because without them showing up, if they'd showed up early. They could that could have um, alerted the Japanese fighters they needed to get back up to altitude, and of course one set of dive bombers isn't going to do as much damage as two, um, and vice versa. If Yorktowns had shown up early, perhaps Enterprise's dive bombers would have been on the receiving end of a renewed combat air patrol. But instead, you both they both turn up, and all of a sudden three carriers are taken out almost immediately. Um, that's probably the single largest element of luck involved. Yeah, that that's uh, actually connected to also to the point number two to uh, the mm. Enterprise dive, dive bombers spotting the Arashi that was returning from hunting the submarines. Yeah, yeah, that but, was uh, incredibly I, lucky. Uh, e- even though I kind of looking at the map, I'm kind of doubtful it was it had that much uh, influence because McClus- McCluskey's bombers were anyway going to turn back to the carriers, and that would basically take them in the same course that they followed. It's just yeah. they turned. A minute or two earlier but it definitely like helped to reinforce them that okay there is some target there because this little boat is going there yeah and it, and it, again it is, it's a matter of that that precise timing because even if they had arrived three four minutes out even if they arrived just after and not not giving it enough time for the japanese fighters to get back up to altitude but even then if it's one stream of dive bombers a few minutes break, another stream of dive bombers. Well, not only is that first stream not going to have done as much damage, but also there's fewer of them, which means uh, easier an easier time for the Japanese anti-aircraft crews. The 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 amount of happenstance involved in having basically every almost every serviceable dive bomber in the American carrier groups show up at the same time is just amazing. But well, also, like uh, not every serviceable because there is no, one there's still one, one carrier group that yeah. did absolutely nothing throughout the day. They they yeah. were, they got really unlucky. The Hornet air group that's uh, basically missed target on every opportunity they can. Hmm. Yeah, hence almost <laughs> not not quite all. Also, okay. don't forget that constant spotting and relaunching and cycling of the combat air patrols meant yeah. they couldn't get any strike packages off. You certainly yep. can't do it while you're under attack, and you absolutely can't do it when the flight deck's full of fighters. Mm. That's uh, actually that's one of the myths that uh, that was like the most stubborn in the Western histories. That was the Fujita narrative that uh, the dive bomber strikes came just as the flight decks were full of strike planes yeah, ready to absolutely. take off. Uh, we'll talk about that particular yep. uh, piece of okay. bullshit later. <laughs> so, shall we move to question number two? W- uh, wait, we still mm-hmm. have uh, point number oh, one. Oh yes, here. point number one. Uh, can you get but, that uh, on the screen? Th- yes, yes. Th- th- that will Absolutely. be, I think, mercifully short. Uh, hopefully, maybe. <laughs> but uh, uh, here also, uh, the thing is uh, uh, ah. that uh, famous Tone number four plane. Yes, it took off uh, about uh, 30 minutes too late. But on the other hand, it also it seems to have cut its flight path short. So if it actually flown the initially designed flight path at the time, uh, launching at the time when it was supposed to, it would find the Americans about 30 minutes later. So, so this is this is a part I, I, I can't understand, right? With, yeah. uh, okay, like, so... Like three uh, so carriers, three, no, no, I mean, with three yeah. carriers there, right, relying on spotting only from a spotting plane from, from a single cruiser, or, uh, or like, like they just did not launch enough reconnaissance. Yeah, uh, they that, had that was, plenty of planes they could have used. Yeah, uh, that was basically, that was the Japanese doctrine. The Japanese doctrine relied on spotting from cruisers, and the carrier planes were reserved only for strike. Basically, 
uh, Nagumo kind of vi violated the doctrine when he went basically above what was expected of him when he assigned two carrier planes to extend the search into the region south of Midway because during the war games before the battle uh, that's where the like opposing party created a nasty surprise for him but apart from that all reconnaissance was done by uh, cruiser planes by mm -hmm. doctrine and that's that's also one of the problems because okay. there wasn't enough of them yeah and that's something that extends throughout the entire japanese fleet because the tones are designed to operate with the carriers as as the the cruiser scouts but you also have them trying to build the Oyodos and the Aganos, and they're all trying to do the same thing. They're trying to basically offload the scouting duties for whether it be submarine, for submarines, cruiser squadrons, destroyer flotillas, or the carriers. They're all trying to offload them into these single resources to free up the, yeah. in theory, free, free up the relevant units for full battle mode. Yeah, but uh, in any case, the plane that took off. Uh, the plane reported that it had an uh, engagement with the uh, American patrol plane, even though I think American <coughs> records didn't show it, so maybe they just avoided the uh, Catalina. But anyway, either that pushed him off course, or he decided to cut the flight path short to get back to the cruiser at the originally planned time, and that landed him in the place to spot the American carriers at about 7.28 in the morning. I have a cheat sheet here. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's go. So I, I know you guys have unlimited amounts of information yeah. about everything, but um, we, we, like let's 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 mm -hmm. try and do a few more questions, yep. and then we'll, sure. we'll we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the question number two was sent in by Drumroll. I'm waiting for it to come to screen. What 2016 gunner, one of our very regular forum users, thank you for participating. Mm -hmm. um, if the Japanese had launched their planes to attack the US carriers as they were armed without losing important time switching between talks and bombs, could they have won the battle? Good question there. Uh, that's a good question, but uh, it has few problems, but I think I will let uh, maybe Drachi uh, throw some light on <laughs> this because that's uh, well, hmm. yes, I mean, theoretically, a bomb can do damage, but it's, I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's a whole, as you said, there's a whole series of things. But if, if you were, if you are to take the question as read and just go, okay, well, what happens if you just order the strike, the strike off with, um, with their pre-existing payloads, well, it's, it's, it's where, whereabouts are you going with that because they're if i remember correctly they switch they're actually switching between loads a couple of times um so are they taking off with their original original load of torpedoes are they taking off with their um switched load out of bombs or are they taking off well, well and then obviously you've got the, the what's actually going on um could they have won the battle uh well it, possibly it's, it's, yeah, possibly. It's a bit up in the air, really. It's yeah. it's if you get if you get your strike out, if you get your strikes out, well, you've got as we've just discussed with Hornet's um, group, you've got to actually find the enemy. <laughs> yeah. um, you could very well end up launching your entire strike group and miss the Americans completely, which is less than helpful. Um, the Gumo had a, had a problem that the Americans didn't have because he was having to take out Midway's. Uh, Air, air group and neutralize the defenses at midway and for that you need high explosive bombs which aren't particularly useful against you know carriers and warships mm. um and then of course you know if you're going to swap that out because he was constantly dithering over whether or not he was w which target he was going to go for you know where midway is you can't sink midway but you always know where midway is and midway had something like 120 aircraft um and the first yeah it's a carrier that you can't sink and the first strike against midway didn't knock out its defenses so they needed to do that again but they also were conscious of the fact that they and they thought two actually there were three american carriers out there even that came as a surprise initially because they didn't expect america to want to fight over midway um the fact that america decided no screw you we're fighting here uh was a, a fairly major upset to their plans in the first place so sorry you were gonna... uh, well they they expected them to fight but they expected them to fight according to the japanese plan so like Five days later. <laughs> yes, the, the yeah. war gaming plans uh, <laughs> that they conducted in Tokyo. Yeah. Oh, we're going to yeah. a whole yeah. new... Uh, whole but another, yeah, uh, another thing is also that uh, basically already by the time the Nagumo got the spotting report, 
Uh, he was already after first attack by planes from midway. Uh, just after the spotting report, he was under another attack by the dive bombers from, mid from midway. Then he had the B-17s coming in. Then he had another dive bomber attack from midway. So he had to maneuver constantly. And also another important thing, by the time he got all this information, all the American strikes were already on the way. So yeah. That's... So, yeah, so it's it's going to be a mute at that point. Even even if the if the Japanese get their aircraft off, it at best it's going to be a mutual kill. Um, may, maybe Hiryu survives, um, but yeah. that's that that's still not great considering that the <coughs> Japanese go in with the numerical advantage. And the the other thing is is not just it's not just that it's high explosive bombs, but also you've got to remember the the difference is between the Kates and the Vals. Are, are more than skin deep uh, an aircraft i mean an aircraft that is a torpedo bomber can drop bombs but it's not going to be anywhere as it's not suited. a dive bomber yeah it's not a dive bomber it's not as suited it's not as accurate as a dive bomber so what what percentage of uh benefit you'd get out of those strikes to be honest probably the, the greatest advantage would probably be more as distractions for the anti-aircraft battery um, to yeah. allow the dive bombers to come in somewhat less opposed, but yeah, it's it's not it's not something that's going to manifestly decisively win the Japanese the battle. It's it's going to be more of a, a mutual kill scenario if possible. But as I said, if if you're the one going in as the aggressor with the larger fleet and what you manage is a mutual kill, that's actually technically a loss. Yeah, so, even so, if so, even if you achieve a mutual kill, America wins mm. because they've still got midway. And there's uh, also yeah. another time-related factor that basically, by the time uh, the scout plane reported that the enemy force is accompanied by what looks like a carrier, that's like uh, mm. how accurate the spotting reports were, Nagumo had a midway strike returning uh, like 15 minutes out from his carriers, and he just cannot have them circling endlessly because uh, a lot of the planes were damaged, the planes were low, low on fuel, so he would be risking basically losing half of his strike force on the first strike mm. in uh, like operation that was supposed to last for a week. Mm. So yeah. basically he would risk it's, it's, getting his uh, force greatly diminished. So. If you'll allow one, one question yeah. for Twitch chat, right? A lovely mm. bear is asking, uh, wasn't it unusual for Nagumo to disobey Yamamoto's orders to keep the reserves armed for anti-ship? Well, uh, this was not really an order, more like a recommendation. And uh, again, Nagumo was under conflicting things because he knew that he has to knock Midway out. He was under attack from Midway planes, so he knew that it is a threat. The invasion force was already attacked by Midway pla planes the night before. And uh, he also sailed one day later than the plan called for, so he knew that he has one day less to basically pummel Midway into submission, even though, well, is this debatable whether he would be able to do that anyway but he was under this kind of pressure and like basically that was the dilemma like what what is he supposed to do is, is no he supposed to just it's keep it's half of his plane endlessly without action and just yeah, yeah. It, well, it wasn't easy that's the, the other thing you've got to bear in mind is actually this is something that it, that shows up several times in large battles involving the japanese navy in the you almost want to say it's almost like a dog chasing a car it wouldn't actually know what to do with it once they caught it and the same with the japanese they've planned this massive set piece battle assuming that hopefully the americans will come in according to their schedule and they'll be able to attack midway and fight the u.s navy and then they actually end up attacking midway and fighting the u.s navy and they can't decide which one is the more important and you'd it, this, see this it, yeah sorry yeah. I was just saying, you'd see this um, with the Japanese all the way throughout World War II, from Pearl Harbor onwards. They would concoct these massively elaborate plans that relied on everything working exactly as it did. And yeah. whenever it didn't, they had no idea what to do. It worked at Midway, uh, not Midway, it worked at Pearl Harbor because pretty much everything went according to plan at Pearl Harbor. But if you look at the Battle of the Coral Sea, look at Midway, you look at the Philippines, you look at uh, um, uh, Guadalcanal, the later battles of Guadalcanal, anytime the Americans did something to throw a spanner into the Japanese plans, they still carried on trying to execute the plan that they trained for, even though that plan was never going to work anymore because now the situation changed. They just, they just couldn't improvise. 
There's a, there's a question, if I, if I may yeah. interject here, um, Jingles, uh, maybe you can answer this, from Julian Heafy. He's asking, if Yamamoto knew that the future of war will be CVs, then why not destroy them first instead of battleships at Pearl Harbor? He thinks, they, uh, he understands that they had enough intel to know when the CVs would be in port. They didn't really have enough intel for that. They just knew that typically on Sunday the CVs might be there, along with the rest of the fleet. What he said. Mm. But on the other hand, the U.S. Navy knew that the war is coming because like the war preparations around the Philippines and in Southeast Asia were pretty clear by the time. So they actually were reinforcing all the garrisons and uh, they were trying to keep at least one carrier at sea at any time. And by a coincidence, on the December 7th, Enterprise was delayed by bad weather, so didn't make it in port in the morning as it was supposed to. So yeah. both were yeah. out at sea. And and okay. this this whole thing c comes back to actually one of the key, one of the key traits of a good naval commander or a brilliant naval commander is decisiveness. You have to be able to decide and make a judgment, often very very close uh, close time limits. What am I going to do? What is my priority? And then go after that. Um, if 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 Nagumo had been able to decide, I mean he knows the U.S. Navy's out there at this point. He should have decided either I'm going after the carriers or I'm going after Midway. He ends up trying to do both. And, it, well, this yeah. is what happens. If he, if he, I mean, going after Midway would have been the suboptimal choice. But even he, then, if Midway is not going anywhere, no. he can go after Midway anytime he wants. Yeah. But if even the, if, if the even, invasion force has to wait a day, then it just waits a yeah. day. But even if he had gone after it, and I say that would be the suboptimal choice, but even if he had, if he managed at least to knock out the Midway airfield, he could have come away with something. Which is much better to go after the carriers, because, yeah, as you say, it's, it's very difficult to knock out a fixed airfield, and the carriers are the things with the planes that can actually hit you, considering that Midway's aircraft weren't exactly stellar in that regard. Um, but it, this is the thing. It, you, have to, you have to make a decision. You you cannot be a good naval officer and sit there going oh yeah well but if maybe um uh, uh let's do both and because then you look around and suddenly you find that let's do both means that everything's on fire and it didn't help Nagumo's position that Yamamoto was making these suggestions um yeah. which which were basically I don't know if you've ever read any um, transcripts of signals sent from superior uh, from in Japanese army. Uh, commanders to their uh, subordinates. They never really issue orders. They, they're, they're very, very polite and elaborate and flowery in the language that they use. It's often open to misinterpretation, but they they, they, they would often try to not actually issue a direct order. I mean, the, the standing operational order for the, for the mission would be written down in no uncertain terms. But after that, the signals that were sent between subordinates and superiors there was very clear you must do this and 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 so on and so on and so on they would make suggestions it would be desirable if you could but you know, it left it open to interpretation and and those were the kind of messages that nagumo was getting from yamamoto which didn't help if you'll allow one quick off topic question yeah. Jingles, someone mm -hmm. on youtube was asking about the horse thief <laughs> there were no witnesses all right nobody could prove anything <laughs> okay Fair enough, that's all yeah. we're getting. Okay, so we head over to question number three and see um, what it has in store for us. Drum roll. I have a little bit of delay here. So it's from CMC Mullet who's asking, do you agree with the idea of the miracle at Midway? I agree a certain amount of luck was involved, but think the training and general culture of each naval service had more to do with it than a miracle. 100% agree. Yes. Um, it's, and this is something that we could talk about for hours so we i at least will try to be brief uh, i said at the beginning of the stream uh no disrespect intended not trying to diminish the amazing achievement that the u.s navy won that day because it was amazing but it was not a miracle the battle was not nearly as one-sided uh as it is commonly believed yes the japanese had overwhelming superiority in ships but which of those ships actually mattered because i actually have a a bit of a graphical demonstration here. Okay. Of, of what? Because I've printed out the Japanese order of battle for the Battle of Midway. Well, uh, you printed it out. You know, I have a graphic here, right? Yeah. Well, 
I mean, put I in the graphic. Push, push the button. So, like, I mean, no offense to your paper, yeah. Taki. No, but uh, mm. it's the like a uh, graphical demonstration because I can just throw this out because this one fa side has all ships that were involved in the actual battle. The rest was out in the Aleutians. Yeah. Uh, 600 miles away, like one day of sailing away from uh, Nagumo in case of anything happens. Somewhere oh. else, they were basically spread out across the North Pacific, but nobody could really reinforce Nagumo when uh, the manure hit the windmill. Yeah, and if you look at the actual numbers involved, where it mattered in the battle, America had a numerical advantage. They had the same number of landing strips, because they had the mid midway, they had three carriers, one more than the Japanese thought, uh, the Japan, yes, they had technically more carriers, but they only had four fleet carriers. The light carriers could barely put up enough aircraft to defend themselves. And America actually, because they also had the 120 aircraft from Midway, actually enjoyed a numerical aircraft superiority over the Japanese. Yes, the Japanese had all these battleships and cruisers, but they were the invasion force. They couldn't get involved in the battle until the air battle had been won. If you don't win the air battle, you can't bring all of those other forces to bear. So this numerical superiority that's often bandied about that the Japanese enjoyed over the Americans is just not true. Uh, yep, that's uh, that's basically one of one of the problems for, of the plan because basically Yamamoto was hoping to trigger the decisive battle. He hoped to uh, destroy not only American carriers but also American battleships. So he didn't want to spook the Americans by like showing up with the Yamato because he was afraid that they won't be willing to fight so he was basically his plan was to capture midway then have uh, two congos parading around with few heavy cruisers as a bait and basically trigger the battle this way uh, in the end uh, basically the funny thing is that uh, a lot of a uh, lot of uh, things were said said also about the intercept of the signals about americans basically knowing uh, the bulk of the plan but the thing is if the signals were not intercepted then Again, it won't go according to plan because then the Americans wouldn't sail because Enterprise and Hornet would be in South Pacific and uh, like Nimitz wouldn't be stupid enough to send out uh, Yorktown and Saratoga alone. So, well, to be honest, if they knew if they knew that everything, if they didn't know that Midway was about to happen, they wouldn't have made such a rush job of patching up Yorktown. So by the time they yep. realised what's going on, half our engines would have been in bits over over the dockyard. Exactly. So there's a question here from KM Super Bismarck, um, who was asking, after Midway, one of the ensigns suggested that they take their battleships and shell Midway instead. Yamamoto mm -hmm. told them that would be pointless. Why so? Because they didn't have air superiority. <laughs> yeah. They would lose all of those battleships. Look what happened to Japan's battleships um, when they didn't enjoy air superiority and the Americans found them. And, and if you're close enough to shell Midway with a battleship, trust me, they're going to find you with their aircraft <laughs> and yeah, lose yeah. those battleships. Midway's going to be doing something called calling for help. <laughs> the battleship yeah. over there, please get rid of it. Um, and plus the other things, to be perfectly honest, whether you're looking at something like Wake Island or Midway, shore bombardment of those kind of locations is actually really difficult. It, it might not seem as much when you look at the shore bombardments, places like Anzio and Salerno and uh, D-Day, but a lot of these Pacific Islands are very flat. Um, it's all very well to be to have defences built into a sloping shoreline where if the shell is <laughs> off off the target by a metre or two, it doesn't really matter that much because it's just going to explode in the rocks around you and that's probably going to do just as much damage. But on something that's really nice and flat, like, say, an atoll um, or a very, very worn down bit of the Hawaiian archipelago, a shell that misses very slightly is probably going to carry quite a few meters that way before detonating so you pretty much have to be spot on and with the best will in the world whilst battleship fire control in world war ii is pretty good it's pretty good in the realms of there's a target several hundred feet long over there we might hit it with one or two shells from a salvo it's not there's a trench six feet wide let's drop a 16 inch or 14 inch shell into it <laughs> Yeah, I was I was reading there was uh, in the later stages of the war um, the Japanese did quite a lot of shelling of American emplacements on the American islands and it didn't really do that much. Yeah, I mean, it, like the shelling would be good to, for example, disable air pier, airfield for you a can, night you or destroy two. destroy the aircraft, right? Yeah. But, you know, if there's mm. holes in the runway, they'll just 
I, I mean the uh, like uh, even the first strike against Midway is kind of illustrative because it was considered pretty mm. accurate by the Americans, but still it cost like what six dead and mm. no no weapons actually disabled. So about the only the, yeah the only good thing that you might might have been able to accomplish by shelling Midway to be honest would have been to send something like maybe send the Congos in first because if they go and fate. Yeah, if they go and start shelling Midway, Midway's going to be going at help, which means that there's a chance that the US carrier strike groups will come in and attack the Congos. Now, fair enough, you'll probably then lose the Congos, but the Americans have just then expended their, their strike packages and you can follow them back to where they came from. Well, yes, but uh, in the like in the general uh, mm. attitude of the Japanese Navy, using like battleships to soak up damage that's a blasphemy oh yeah yeah they would, of it, course. it's nothing they would ever really have <laughs> no they would they, they, yeah they, i mean there's a good reason they didn't do it but it was against their doctrine <laughs> but if we if we're talking hypotheticals yeah. that would have been that yep. would have been the best use of the battleship you know assuming they didn't get torpedoed and sunk by the submarine screen on the way in yeah, to be fair it's the mark 14 early 1942 well, they might have scraped <laughs> some paint <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah true there was actually a question earlier on in youtube chat sorry i forgot the name but the, about the use of submarines so basically in this battle there was one real success of submarine it was the japanese i-168 uh, sinking yorktown and apart from that the american submarines basically too involved in the battle both caused some damage but rather indirectly first it was nautilus because uh, nautilus tried to attack the japanese fleet uh, was discovered and uh, destroyer was detached to keep it keep her submerged so that was the destroyer that then the dive bombers spotted and used as a guide mm -hmm. and the, the other was the tambor which uh, actually uh, did not engage enemy but the Mogami and Mikuma, when evading the submarine, collided. So it was like, <laughs> yeah. Also, <laughs> uh, because one of the vital thing that the submarines did during Midway, um, it well not not vital, certainly vital if you were a member of the air crews involved, uh, not just in Midway but in every subsequent American operation, was to recover downed aircrew. They saved a lot of American pilots and aircrew who would otherwise have died. Yeah, I mean to be honest, yeah, with with the Mark 14 in the state that it was in at that point being distractions by existing and being spotted is probably about the best you can hope for the american submarines to do that the the chances of a even a perfectly aimed mark 14 spread actually accomplishing anything other than annoying everybody is pretty slim at this at point at that stage of the war yeah at that stage yeah. of the war <laughs> shall we head over to the next question yes mm -hmm. by okay, all means cool uh, by the way, there was a comment there from uh, Karahan Keskin on YouTube who was asking, didn't Congo and Haruna bombarding Henderson Field in October 1942 destroy more than half of the Cactus Air Force's airplanes? Yes, I believe they did, but uh, half, right? There was still half it's, of the planes left to yeah. come and then afterwards, uh, you know, like really, really hurt those uh, those battleships. And there's two battleships bombarding um, um, an airfield all night and the airfield was still operational the next morning. Yes, and those aircraft were being resupplied and replaced. And when they came back to try to do it again, they didn't enjoy nearly as much success. Mm. Yes, because this was in the fleet of flood at flood tide, so I know this. Ha! No, this was in Neptune's Inferno. Oh, Neptune's Inferno. <laughs> anyway, I read the book. <laughs> That's what counts. It was in right? one of his books. Yes, yes. yes. Well, yes. Finale, Neptune's it's, Inferno. Yes, but it, I read it. Okay, yeah. so Daniel Allen Clark's asking, why is Midway considered a decisive battle when subsequent carrier battles would continue to be important and contested? Indeed, after the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, October 1942, the Imperial Japanese Navy would have carrier superiority in terms of numbers, and the Imperial Japanese Navy offensive continued, most notably in the Southwest Pacific. Post Santa Cruz, the US Navy had only one carrier remaining in the Pacific, and it was damaged. Midway is certainly a dramatic victory, but it was hardly decisive in the sense of the meaning of the phrase "decisive battle." I love your like. I love the way yes, you wrote your a, question. That's a very First nice... of all, I have to like shout out to you, Mister Mister Alan yeah. Clark. So I, I think this comes down. It comes down to there's a number of ways you can classify a battle as decisive. In the tactical sense, it's definitely a decisive battle because it's an absolutely stunning victory. You look at the the loss sheet on both sides. That's a decisive victory by any means. Um, but also when it when it comes to calling it a decisive battle in the more strategic realm, 
yes, obviously the, the US Navy would eventually be down to one operational carrier um, later on in the year. But you have to consider what's the situation before Midway, what's the situation after. Before Midway, the Imperial Japanese Navy has come away either the outright winner or the partial winner of every engagement it's taken part in. The Japanese advances have not been checked except at really Coral Sea. And Coral Sea's cost them the Lexington and it's cost the Yorktown quite a bit of damage. And the, the Coral Sea is still a tactical Japanese victory when you look at the, the numbers of ships yeah. lost on both sides. So going into Midway, based on their prior experience, the best the Americans can hope for would be something like maybe Coral Sea, i.e. they turn back the, the Midway invasion force and maybe sink a carrier or two, but quite possibly get two or possibly all three of their carriers wiped out in exchange. Fair enough, long term, America can afford that, but that's not exactly the kind of victories you want. Um, but coming out of Midway, the score sheet is so hilariously lopsided, it it shows not just the US Navy, but everybody else that, yes, in fact, the Japanese can be defeated defeated and defeated decisively. You can walk away from the field in an engagement with the Japanese and say, yes, we have actually won this completely. They've lost their ships. They've lost their objective. There, there is no there is nothing that they can the Japanese can spin out of midway that says it's a victory. And then that sets a tone going forward, because if, if you can imagine if Midway had been Coral Sea Mark II, whether or not the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands would even have happened is is one question. But two, if it, even if they had put whatever had survived into Santa Cruz, you probably would have seen them playing a lot more conservatively because it would have been literally the last holes yeah. America had. Yeah. Um, and instead, because they're coming out of midway, they know they can win. They, it's it's a mindset that says, right, we we can we can continue to drive forward, and that's what pushes the fact that even though they do lose um, obviously Hornet at Santa Cruz they're still fighting you see that spirit when Enterprise is the only one left when they're just saying yeah it's us against Japan so what we're going to go on if if they come off of a string of multiple ships going down in exchange for slowing the Japanese offensives down that, that would have been an entirely different late 42 early 43 period so it, it, you don't have to completely defeat the enemy for your battle to be decisive. I mean, being a Brit, Brit, you just look at something like the Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain didn't end Nazi Germany by a long shot, but it turned the tide of showing that you could actually beat them. And yeah. so it's seen as a turning point, even though no, no part of Europe was liberated by the Battle of Britain, but it's still a turning point in the war. And similarly with Midway, um, although the Americans are at much less risk of losing the war, um, it's it's uh, it's definitely a, a, a massive turning point in terms of both the outcomes of individual battles and how the US Navy is going to perceive itself going into the next round. Uh, I think actually we can paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill here a bit that uh, basically it was not the beginning of the end but it was the end of the beginning. Uh, basically, mm. it was yeah the end of the like defensive uh, strategy and uh, it allowed a limited offensive in the in the Solomons. Mm. But, yes. uh, you could, you it's, could it's... argue that Japan went into Midway having never lost a battle. Coral mm. Sea, jury's out. Um, tactical <laughs> victory, strategic defeat. Um, but after they ever win a battle after Midway? Uh, oh, come yes. on, the little ones around Savo Island, but no, yeah. none of the big set pieces. Now, uh, basically, one set piece as well, the, what was mentioned in the question mm. even, the Battle of Santa Cruz was quite clear Japanese tactical victory because I mean, okay, they uh, lost two carriers damaged, US Navy lost Hornet uh, permanently, and Enterprise was uh, quite heavily damaged. But it was kind of a pyrrhic victory, because uh, the Japanese air groups were completely shredded there. Hmm. Basically, yeah, they, they managed to score, yeah. but uh, they lost uh, over 150 air crew members versus Americans losing 26. Yeah, and yeah, you, can't, so you can't afford to have many victories. Exactly. Like no, it, no. It's, it, this thing, exactly, it's, it's not a true. It's not a true victory. It's yeah. You you walk away with a. You walk away from. You can. This is the thing. It's, it's like Coral Sea. It's not a true victory. I mean, fair enough. It's not a true defeat either way. But it's yeah. it's not 
compared to something like the Battle of the Java Sea. <laughs> oh yeah. So, so yeah. basically, the and the, the Coral Sea was basically, I mean, it's still in the topic because it's the career mm. battles of forty two. So that was basically the last of the career battles, and it was a battle where the air groups of the Shokaku and Zuikaku were basically suffering so such heavy losses for the third time in half a year because they were shredded at the Coral Sea. They paid very heavily for their success. They were shredded at the Eastern Solomons where they paid heavily for a draw. And then for their victory at Santa Cruz, they also were utterly, completely... Like, uh, there, is, there are descriptions from the deck officers of the uh, Junior who describe how the planes were coming back basically all shot up and with the crews in the state of shell shock because they never saw such intensive heavy, heavy AA fire and basically... Basically, the end result of the of the Santa Cruz was that the, while the Americans were defeated, they still had carrier with functioning air group in battle. Yeah. By the way, Chad, I, I may I point out that behind Taki, you can see the uh, continuously um, southward uh, moving uh, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Shanhors hanging. Uh, and things we were never going to get any better for Japanese aircrew because America was constantly evolving um, the equipment and technology and techniques to direct that anti-aircraft firepower. Um, things like radar fused anti-aircraft shells for example um fire control radar you know all these kinds of technologies that japan just didn't have and so yeah and, american and aviators never had to face but the japanese uh, not not to mention the training um and the fact that the <laughs> the u.s navy rotated some of their top pilots out sent yes. them back home mm -hmm. to train recruits mm -hmm. Whereas yes, the Japanese absolutely. just mm. kept spending their their yep. top pilots and losing. Japan and America did the Japan and Germany, sorry, did exactly the same mm. thing. Uh, the good pilots just kept fighting until they were killed. Whereas the Americans, you know, once you'd proven yourself, you'd have flown a certain number of missions, you'd got a certain number of kills, you'd you'd acquitted yourself as a pilot. That was it. You're out of combat. Mm. Back to the USA. Teach more people to be as good as you. And and that even shows through. Then to be honest, even if the Japanese had the same training system. They would still have been at a massive disadvantage after some after Midway, Santa Cruz, etc., because, as you as we pointed out, the sheer number of aircraft and pilots lost. It's all very well having sort of rotating your good pilots back, but if your good pilots don't survive the big yeah. battles, they're not going to be back to train anyone anyway. Um, yeah. If even if both sides have the same training system, at the end of 1942, the Americans can point to several hundred battle-hardened pilots and go, right, we're going to take the best of you lot and you're going to train the next generation. The Japanese are probably looking at half, if not less, of that. And, or, it was... and even if they were going to use that yeah. training system, they just have a much smaller pool to choose from. And it was reading. even uh, like made worse by the aftermath of the Battle of Midway when because basically Japan the Japanese Navy was so hard uh, uh, trying to keep the losses secret they they didn't really care about the Americans learning about the losses because they knew that the Americans knew but they didn't want the army to know about the losses <laughs> yes yeah. the, and um, Japan's uh, so, other major enemy in World War II. <laughs> yes uh, yeah, so, so the basically what they did with all those experienced uh, carrier pilots who survived midway which was basically most of the air groups because hmm. they they didn't use them to build new air groups they shuff, shuttled them to south pacific and basically isolated them there so that nobody learns about the defeat and so that they get killed there yeah. Yeah. so that also did not really help to maintain the air groups like at peak efficiency because well just as an example of how terrible the state of the Japanese air crews were later on in the war, uh, I think it was in time for the Battle of the Philippines, um, 1944. And Japan, that, at that point, they were, they, they were using their carriers as bait. <laughs> they, they weren't really a strike force anymore. Um, and they had decided that they were going to defend the Philippines with land-based aircraft. But the air bases that had the range to defend the Philippines didn't actually have any aircraft. So they were going to fly, I think it was 60 um, fighters from truck down to, I can't remember where it was. But the state of pilot navigation training was so bad that only 20 of them made it. The rest got lost along the way. 
Yeah, I read about that as well. Um, there was one more um, interjection question here yes. from mm-hmm. Shreyes Bhagavatula. I'm sorry about my pronunciation of your name. He says, I would like to ask about the, inc- the uh, about the intricacies of the battle. Would the quality of the combat aircraft and the carriers themselves have had anything to do with the results? That's a very tricky question. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, at, the, at, the, at this point in Midway specifically, the the various arguments where you might have something like zero versus wildcat those arguments are slightly less relevant than they will be later on in the war because the americans are still trying to get the measure of the zero and um they haven't quite developed the counterattacks i mean if you look at uh thatch and his experiences there most of his experiences consist of zero after zero after zero plummeting out of the sky and strafing and him doing his level best to just stay out of the way of the cannon rounds um before if obviously eventually managing to to shoot some of them down so aircraft wise it's a bit of a wash um ship wise again both sides carriers are von- quite vulnerable to dive bombing assaults and being set on fire but that's a well, that's that's a function of a, another question. We'll come to a bit later, maybe a bit come to a bit later on about whether or not you have your your armor deck on the flight deck or the hangar deck. But the the, the Japanese carriers aren't bad ships. Um, it's more a function of when they when they get hit, what are the damage control systems on board, which is slightly different to ship design itself. Um, your damage control systems include the crew and your training, which you could have the world's best designed ship and rubbish damage control crew and you'll still burn like a roman candle um so yeah it's i think the the the, when it comes to qualitative differences you're looking more at the human side of things than necessarily the strict technical design standpoint at this point in time so with i would say with one exception that being the the tbd the devastator torpedo bomber which (laughs) was which was the best in it best in the world at the time uh, not long before World War Two, but things have moved yes. on so swiftly that by 1942, it was just forget yeah. it. Just but I mean, the, uh, early war torpedo bombers getting caught by fighters are in a world of hurt, whoever they are, whether they be swordfish, albacores, devastators. I mean, the Midway Avengers didn't exactly get out of yeah. it unscathed either, um, and they're the next generation. But yeah, it's it, it's a little bit of a wash there. I mean, the Japanese probably actually have the advantage at that point with uh, with their torpedo bombers they've got the advantage there but um yeah it, life life as a low low and slow torpedo bomber in the early part of world war ii is not fun when you see I, fighters I, showing up yeah, yeah. Can't I mean, it fun. was the year was the year when you could argue that they were still trying to make the whole concept of torpedo bombers work because if you want to sink a ship you get it with a torpedo right mm, yeah. well actually I think you'll find that dive bombers are a lot more effective, but they haven't actually learned it yet at that stage. Everybody was still trying to make torpedo bombs work. And sometimes well, they did. I, I mean, the US Navy was kind of like oscillating between torpedo bombers and dive bombers because, for example, Ranger was built without uh, torpedo facilities at all. That was supposed to work only with dive bombers. But yeah, the TBD was kind of, well, I, I mean, uh, low and slow, if you are <laughs> trying to catch a ship that's doing 35 knots flank speed, with a plane that's doing 90 knots mm. and you actually have to maneuver to get into like a good launch solution you, you just can't that's yeah, I can that, imagine. that's also uh, one of the things like all these torpedo attacks were taking so long they were like 20 30 minutes affairs where when the torpedo boomers were just trying to chase down the japanese ships and all the time under constant barrage of fighter attacks so while the dive bomber attack was just well uh five minutes and uh, let's go home <laughs> Sh- shall we head over to the next question gentlemen? yes yes what? i think is it was it number five jingles you have something else to say no 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 i was okay. reaching for my beer so let's have a look at number five that's right there's some really really good questions submitted that's for sure okay so ah. yeah this is the one you wanted to talk about for so long so it's from a navy swo and he's asking, compare and contrast the role of damage control within the U.S. and Japanese navies. It's like an assignment for school. This is an <laughs> often overlooked element of the Battle of Midway. In particular, take a look at the punishment taken by USS Yorktown during the battle. 
Was this one of many decisive components of the battle? For your information, every US sailor is required to become certified in all damage control stations and roles today. This is largely as a result of learned experiences during World War II. I'm sure that's something Jingles can tell us more about as well. Because absolutely. He, he's, he's done it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, during World War II, every member of the US Navy, every member of the Royal Navy was required to learn damage control and firefighting. Damage control and firefighting is everybody's responsibility on British or American warships. It's not the responsibility of half a dozen people in the forward and aft damage control and firefighting stations, and that's their job and their job only. If you come across a fire or a flood, you fight the fire, you raise the alarm, and you stay there and continue fighting the fire until somebody with better equipment turns up to relieve you, which will usually happen within two minutes. And that is an amazingly good point, because look at the damage that American carriers sustained throughout the course of the war in the Pacific, and then you look at the damage that the Japanese carriers and warships sustained during the course of the war in the Pacific. Nearly every time a Japanese carrier was set on fire, almost without exception, it sank. Because Japan just didn't place the same value on damage control and firefighting. That was a defensive field of thought. Right? Japan didn't anticipate getting hit. Right? And the kind of officers that got funneled into um, damage control and firefighting on board ships were not the cream of the crop of the officer cadre. Right? They went into gunnery, torpedoes, aviation. So Japan, in a lot of cases, their crews just didn't know what to do. If a fire broke out in a Japanese carrier, there was as good a chance that the crew nearby would run away rather than try to fight the fire. And it also didn't help that Japan didn't really build their ships to take hits. And I'm not talking about the difference between an armored uh, hangar deck or an armored flight deck here. Just the way that the ship was designed to facilitate the fighting of fires and the control of floods. I mean, yes, they had systems that worked if you didn't take too much damage and the systems weren't knocked out and hopefully you didn't take damage or take a hit in the forward damage control station, for example, which would wipe out half of the crew on board who actually knew the business of damage control and firefighting. Um, but they just, they, they didn't treat it as seriously in their ship design as the British and the Americans did. Um, multiple fuel lines that would be drained down and depressurized um, in the event of an attack simple stuff like you know if there's enemy aircraft coming in and you've got a fuel bowser on the flight deck push it over the side you don't just leave it there um closing all of the bulkheads and uh, through deck doors and hatches to maintain watertight integrity to stop the spread of a fire um closing and opening vents to prevent air from getting to a fire to help to control the spread of the fire things as simple as what they call through uh through through bulkhead connectors where, for example, if you're trying to fight a fire on the other side that's on the other side of a bulkhead, you don't really want to open that bulkhead hatch because that's going to feed fresh air to the fire and it's going to let smoke out and smoke kills more people than fires do. So the Americans and the British would design the bulkheads next to the hatches that you go through with connectors that you could plug one end of a fire hose in from one side and then plug the other end of the fire hose in from the other side. So you could actually feed the hoses through sealed bulkheads and fight the fire without feeding fresh air to the fire and without feeding smoke through to the rest of the ship. Japanese ships didn't have this. So it's not really any big surprise that when a Japanese ship got set on fire, it tended to sink. But when an American ship got set on fire, it tended to not sink. And that was because of the crew, the doctrine, mm -hmm. the equipment, and the whole attitude towards firefighting it being everybody's responsibility, not just the guys in the forward and aft damage control stations, not just the damage control officer, who probably wasn't the brightest um, tool in the box if he was on board a Japanese ship in the first place because they didn't put their brightest and best into the field of damage control. Everybody on the US Navy ship was trained and prepared to deal with the worst when it happened in a way that just didn't happen with the Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, and, when, and when, you, when, you, when Jingles started the segment, there was just a glorious comment in Twitch chat just saying, Dear God, when was Jingles born? <laughs> <laughs> 1970. Yeah, there, and there's, there's, there's also the, there's, um, technical and adaptation factors to take into account because um, one of the things that's very, very, very common on American ships, which isn't common on Japanese ships, is portable pumps, portable petrol powered pumps. 
And yeah, you might lose your central damage control system, no matter how well built it is. But if you've got liberally scattered portable ha um, uh, portable pumping units, yes, they're not as good as your main pumps, but they might hold the fire back long enough for you to get your main systems yeah. back online. Um, and uh, as I say, as well as the innovation part, the uh, when Lexington goes down, Lexington goes down like a Japanese ship goes down at Coral Sea. It catches fire and burns massively but what happens is one of the men aboard yorktown looks at it and goes yeah may maybe we shouldn't leave fuel in in the fuel lines maybe we should actually fill them with co2 and the american navy is adaptable enough to go yeah that's probably a good idea so the next time that happens there aren't fuel fumes floating around everywhere whereas you look at the japanese navy even several years into the war taiho explodes partly because fuel lines get ruptured and it fills a fuel and partly because well the damage control officer thinks that venting petrol fumes throughout the entirety of the ship thus turning it into the world's largest and most heavily armed fuel air bomb is a good idea yes. um, so japanese never yeah. learned the americans always learned and not just in the field of damage control and the firefighting night fighting after the mm. uh well after iron bottom sound in the initial opening battles the cruiser engagements the night battles around guadalcanal they never got caught like that again america learned some hard lessons and they usually had to learn them the hard way but you didn't have to teach them that lesson twice i mean well, you, you, you can make you can I mean, as a cultural thing you can even just point to midway itself where yeah. you've got um zuikaku and shokaku one's damaged but still has most of its air wing the other is um lost most of its air wing but was still intact if the american navy had been in that situation if they'd say had uh, saratoga and lexington and Lexington's air crews had survived and Saratoga's had got trashed, you you can guarantee they would have had Saratoga at Midway with Lexington's air crew. But in the Japanese, like, no, no, no. Air crews are assigned to ship, therefore both carriers are out. So you ended up, I mean, that's, so that's you can speculate, but how would Midway would have gone if the Japanese had had another carrier hull? Yeah, that, that's basically what happened with Yorktown, right? Because they mm. took part of Saratoga's air group and yeah. plugged it on uh, Yorktown because, well... I, actually, they even did uh, switch the fighter wing uh, armament because the hmm. the fighter group uh, switched to a new version of Wildcat with folding wings. Yeah. And uh, that was actually so new that uh, even the ground crews didn't know what to do with it. So <laughs> Jim Flatley, after landing the first uh, first plane, had to show them how to actually fold the wings. <laughs> yeah, but this is, this is the thing. You adapt, innovate, overcome. And the Americans have learned several important lessons just from Coral Sea, the Japanese are going into Midway with pretty much the same doctrine when it comes to damage control and managing their ships as they had before Coral Sea. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think it is a, this, um, you know, their ability to adapt. Um, shall we move on to question number six? I think yeah. we've uh, decisively <laughs> is, concluded that uh, Japanese uh, damage control was subpar. Question number six was sent in by none other than Luke Lucario Nape? I have no idea, dude. Um, what do you think would have been different if the Japanese used British-style armored carriers at Midway? They would have lost <laughs> a bit of their strike potential, but probably wouldn't have been so devastated by the first American strikes and land hits. Admittedly, they would have still needed extremely long times in Japanese dry docks. On the same note, what, in your opinion, was the better type of carrier, armored or unarmored? Oh, <laughs> this question. I, I can actually, believe it or not, I know it's going to come as a massive surprise. I think I, I can answer that question, both of those questions, very, very quickly. <laughs> cool. Um, I don't think it would have made much difference because of what we just discussed. You set a Japanese carrier on fire, whether it has an armored flight deck or not, and it had an alarming tendency to sink because Japan does not into damage control. Um, and any those hits that were suffered by the Japanese carriers were hits with armor-piercing bombs. So your armored flight deck, damage control is what's going to save those carriers, and Japan cannot into damage control. Secondly, what's best, armored or armored armored flight deck with a smaller air group or a much much bigger air group and an unarmored flight deck? Depends where you're using them. I think the American and Japanese choice uh, to have unarmored flight decks in the Pacific and have a much, much bigger air group um, was the right decision for the Pacific because of the nature of that theatre. And I think the British decision to have armoured flight decks because you're fighting in a tiny little Mediterranean sea where you're always within range of lots and lots and lots of land-based aircraft or 
you're fighting around the Arctic convoy route, where your orb is within range of lots and lots and lots of land-based aircraft, and six months of the year, the sun never sets. So you they always know where you are. You're always coming under attack. That's why we used armored carrier flight guns, because we designed our carriers to take hits and keep going. That's not just the design of the carrier itself, the armored flight deck, but also the the, the doctrine of damage control. Um, so one isn't really any better than the other, but I think the Americans' choice to go with what they did in the Pacific was right for the Pacific, and our choice was right for the Arctic convoys in the Mediterranean. And the, yeah, the other thing, you, yeah, the other thing you've just got to remember quickly is that <clears throat> nothing is built in isolation. I mean, Jingles has already pointed out that there's the tactical situation that you've got to take into account, but it's also about the doctrine of the Navy itself. The Royal Navy has its armoured hangar carriers, but they also train their crews quite extensively in night fighting, which at this point in the war, neither the Japanese nor the US Navy can do um, night airborne operations. They're also actually, believe it or not, packing in far more anti-aircraft weaponry per tonne um, before the, the massive proliferation of 20 mil and 40 millimeter that happens in the mid-war period. So there's an entire doctrine that goes with a specific style of carrier. And if you just swap out the carrier, but you keep the old doctrine, either way, bad things are probably going to happen. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I think uh, Taki. I think think you. They don't yeah. need you for this one. Uh, I I will just uh, add uh, one important uh, detail that when that goes both with the armored versus unarmored deck and to, with the damage control thing, specifically for carriers, uh, one uh, advantage in damage control that the U.S. carriers had above the Japanese ones was actually open hunger, uh, because if you look at the pictures of the U.S. carriers, you see all those like rolling uh, screens on the sides instead of the solid hull. What it meant is that both uh, you can air the hangar quite effectively if you need, but moreover, if you have a fire on the hangar deck and you have loaded plane, you can just try to push them in the sea. Or if you have bombs there or whatever. Because, I mean, you know that your war production is anyway going well, so you can afford to throw the planes into the sea and uh, just remove the fire hazard, which was kind of quite often done in in extremis. Okay. And the Japanese hangars were enclosed, so basically if you have fire in there, you cannot remove the flammable things easily. And uh, yeah. Okay. That's, that is actually quite a good point, because smoke clearance is also a very, very important yeah. part of damage control. And the plan for clearing smoke from certain sections of a ship can be quite convoluted, because, well, OK, which vent empties into where? How does it get to the upper deck? Where is it going to go through? Are we going to kill anybody? Or you just open the hangar, sl the hangar screens. Bingo. Smoke's clear. OK. Yep. Let's move Next. on to question number seven. I'm waiting for the delay. Awkward. It's from Jinkuzu <coughs> Eugen. And the question is, for Battle of Midway, wasn't there an IJN battleship fleet somewhere nearby? If they would have been with the carriers of the Imperial Japanese Navy, would have put it have possibly have changed the outcome of that battle, especially adding ships uh, like Yamato and other ships for more anti-air cover, which is kind of what the USA used the battleships for during World War II. Yes, it would have changed think... the outcome of the battles with even bigger de decisive defeat for the Japanese, because then they would have lost all their battleships. In the yeah, uh, from, from, they, they, from... they would have retreated in time, but uh, uh, the thing is, uh, this is kind of uh, debatable, because for one, as I already mentioned, Yamamoto's plan was not to spook the Americans, so the battleships mm. had to be hidden. The other thing is that uh, even Yamato, even though she was uh, fairly fast for her size, was still slower even than Kaga, which was the slowest of the carriers. So they wouldn't be able to keep up with uh, the maneuvering carriers. And uh, again, it was not unusual for the, especially for the Soryu and Hiryu to go all 35 knots and just zoom off. And yeah, the I other thing is that the, the Japanese formation in itself was very very loose basically the carriers were with distances of several kilometers between them then the battleships and cruisers were several kilometers further out and the destroyers were like 20 miles from the center of the formation so basically japanese navy did not do tight formations at the time of the of the war while the u.s navy did the 
like very tightly knit formations, basically with yeah. the, the inner ring one kilometer away from the carrier, the outer ring two kilometers away, and uh, close in escort if there yeah. was one uh, yeah. five hundred so meters what, away. What, what, what I what I remember from reading uh, Mr. Hornfisher's books is also the Japanese Navy um, had really quite subpar anti-aircraft defenses. That's yes. another thing, yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, the, the US are still, at this point, they're still, to a certain extent, operating under their pre-war doctrine. Their carriers are quite spaced out, but they have their individual escort groups. Um, it, it's a li little bit later in the war when they get in, they abandon the, the pre-war doctrine of having carrier, their, the individual carrier hulls relatively spread apart so that you don't lose multiple carriers to a single strike, which frankly is actually exactly what happens to the Japanese at Midway. Um, but the i mean with this question there is a possibility of things going slightly better for the japanese but it depends on what hap on exactly what happens because as you say they the outside of the congos the the battleships aren't keeping up um if you want to go sort of full on let's let's allow the japanese to roll a bunch of natural sixes you could posit that the, the the battleships are forming a screen to kind of the north northeast so they get spotted first and the americans see oh that looks like a really nice big juicy target what on earth is that doing here let's all attack that and then yeah that's probably not a good day to be a japanese battleship crewman but once you've dropped your bomb and your or your torpedo you can't magically regenerate it you have to go back and reload so if that big strike that gets <laughs> that the are you sure problem. about that do you know which game you're playing <laughs> yeah, even the even in even in world of warships you press f and go back home <laughs> um, the uh, but yeah it's the if you want to do it like the the full again the sort of the the full-on japanese japanese getting all the luck if the battleships get hit first regardless of their aa that then gives the cat the Japanese carriers breathing room to launch their own counter strike without getting hit. But it's one of these things that you can construct such a scenario. Whether or not such a scenario is actually reasonably re realistic in terms of could it actually have been done? Would it have actually been done? Given Japanese doctrine, well, they were already following doctrine and they didn't. But even if they were following slightly different doctrine, the odds of the battleships being in exactly the right place at exactly the right time for the American pilots to see them. And then you're also relying on the American pilots to decide we're going to go after battleships and not carriers. That's an awful lot of sixes you need to roll for it to make an actual difference. To be honest, uh, I, I think that probably <clears throat> if uh, Spruance uh, was faced with this find, he would just uh, hightail back to Hawaii because uh, basically they, they were operating under the calculated risk conditions as uh, Nimitz said so if there was stronger Japanese force than anticipated he would probably just retreat and let them uh, fight it off with uh, Midway but well we'll never know mm. but uh, no. this this tactics was actually one uh, that was recommended by Japanese study groups after Midway uh, it was uh, built basically in late 1942 but it was never used in battle because before this mm. could uh, disseminate to the frontline naval units. The situation changed again. But what actually where it was used was uh, in the Battle of the Philippine Sea by the US Navy. Because there Spruance intentionally put his battleships as kind of a bait group in the way of the Japanese air attack. And it, it kind of worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With all that if, radar guided anti aircraft <laughs> fire and yes. anti aircraft guns that actually work on with fuses that are radar detonated. Yeah, that, that, mm. that kind of work. Yeah, the, the fleet at Flood Tide actually has a description of one Hellcat pilot who got a bit too enthusiastic and uh, flew into the AA zone of the battleships. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, it, it sounded like some really scary things. And Thanks. there's actually some video footage here and there that you can see of. Uh, like full U.S. Navy anti-air barrage going up against Japanese planes, and it is like yeah. like a, a scary, scary thing. And there's think, actually one off-topic question, Jiggles, yeah. if you'll mm -hmm. allow it, uh, directed at yourself. Um, and it is, you may be done up for treason after this, but what's your opinion <laughs> on the uh, new Queen Elizabeth uh, aircraft carrier? They seem okay. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I I haven't really been keeping up with. Uh, I, I prefer the historical stuff rather than the modern stuff. For me, it kind of ended in 2011 when I retired. 
uh, wow, it was that long? Yeah, it was that long ago. Um, it's nice that they actually have some aircraft for them now, which we never had on our carriers, you know, for the last seven years I was in the Navy because somebody decided it was a good idea to uh, replace them all with, uh, you know, to retire the sea harriers and replace them with an RAF harriers. But nobody seemed to point out to them that RAF harriers aren't fighters, they're ground attack aircraft. You can stick a couple of sidewinders onto a bomber, but that isn't going to make it an interceptor. So, you know, we were basically operating without air cover, uh, without air cover for the last seven years I was in the Navy. So that's nice. Good job nobody decided to kick off the war with us. But yeah, the Queen Elizabeth seemed okay. Um, controversial decision to make them uh, conventionally powered rather than nuclear, which means they're all constantly tied to the coat tails of an oil tanker. Uh, but that's okay. We've, we've got we've got fuel, sh fuel ships. It's just, you know, hope nobody bothers to sink them and then we'll be fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll all work out. Who knows? The aircraft that they have might even start working soon. You never know. <laughs> well, well, let's hope so. Having had the privilege to be aboard both Prince of Wales and Queen Elizabeth, um, I will just interject that they are very impressive ships. And uh, the, 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 there's certainly a sense of occasion when you're standing in the middle of the flight deck and you're like, Where, where's the edge of the ship gone? <laughs> Help! I'm getting lost on a flat open expanse of metal. I will say that the second island, I think, is a good mm. idea because that's devoted exclusively to air operations. So they're not trying to share real estate with the bridge and, you know, everything else. They've got their own with much, much better visibility and so on. So that, that it looks weird, but it is a good idea. Yeah. OK, cool. Anyway, that was an off-topic question. I think mm. we'll head over to question number eight of the official yes. rotor. Let's see. Back to, back to midway topic or carrier battles, at least. So the question is from Commando Brian, and he's... Quick question. What role did submarines play in the Battle of Midway? Well, we already touched it, that they were generally a major disappointment for both sides, apart from the one Japanese submarine. <laughs> but, uh, who, uh, yeah. who, ro who rolled a natural 20. Mm. Yes. I, I, I mean, he's, uh, th that story was really quite thrilling, because uh, actually after sinking uh, Yorktown and Hammond, he was chased by the rest of the American destroyers and they had to actually try to escape on surface because they got damaged and uh, the batteries have this uh, like uh, uncomfortable thing that they start uh, producing chlorine gas when uh, wet. It's not, not less usually, than ideal. Yeah. Somewhat hazardous to your health. Yes, it's, it's sub <laughs> suboptimal conditions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, in general, like, yeah, what what were actually the Japanese plans for submarines in the battle? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were using submarines to spot uh, Midway and find out what was going on to give them warning of, uh, well, not just to give them uh, an idea of the dispositions of the defenses on Midway, but also to give them warning when Midway was launching aircraft. Uh, I know that, as we mentioned earlier, the American submarine crews. Unfortunately, on with the Mark 14 torpedoes didn't enjoy an awful lot of success on those occasions when they did find something worth shooting at. Um, but they did also uh, save the lives of a lot of downed US air crew, um, and something that Amer American submarines would be used during every uh, American operation uh, from then until the end of the war. Lots of American air crews owed their lives to the crews of American submarines. Yeah, the, the, the Japanese submarines, basically, the intent was to use them as cordons that would uh, discover the approaching American fleet. But the, the problem, ob obviously, was for one, the cordons uh, wouldn't have worked really that well because the patrol fields didn't really overlap. And the other thing is that uh, the submarines got to place only after the Americans already sailed through. So that's kind of disappointing. Yeah, <laughs> It, this is the fundamental problem. You see this time and again in both the First and Second World Wars when people get this idea of using submarines in a fleet role to ambush a fleet. And they keep, seem to keep forgetting that submarines don't move as fast as warships. They're good for taking out convoys when they're faster than the convoys, at least when they're on the surface. But when, when a, a fleet will quite happily cruise at something approximating the flat out top speed of your submarine while it's on the surface you're not going to get into position and th this happens all the time people send out screens like ah yes our submarines will will spot the enemy fleet they'll hunt the enemy fleet they'll sink them they'll weaken them and then it turns out the enemy fleet just went that way about six times faster than the submarines can possibly hope to go the, the odd time the submarines actually intercept enemy 
fleet you units. Have to get lucky. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's the exception that proves the rule more than it's anything like they, else. Like the Americans that got super lucky with the what they sunk sank two two big of the two big fleet carriers, right? Uh, was it? Uh, well, they got uh, Shinano. <laughs> Archerfish got Shinano in a big way once they'd fixed the Mark 14. Um, but Had yeah. Taiho get, well, didn't Taiho get taken out by a submarine as well? I think it was. I think, yeah. I, think, I, I can't remember the names, but yes. I, I yes, think yeah, yeah. Taiho, Taiho got taken out by a submarine. I mean, obviously, Wasp got taken out by a Japanese submarine as well in one of the, one of the most successful torpedo barrages of all time because they blew a hole in North Carolina and put fatal damage into the O'Brien. But. Um, yeah, the, the the fact that for all the effort and all the number of, sort of submarines committed to these various battles, the fact you can literally list number of successful strikes on capital ships in the middle of fleet actions by on submarines one on one hand, compared to how many yeah. bombs and torpedo hits the carrier aircraft put in, I think that just tells you exactly which side which side of that equation is the most effective in a fleet battle. Yeah. Well, oh, aside, aside from the yeah. you know aircrew recovery role, they would have been far far better off just sinking merchant ships. It's what they were good at. Mm. Uh, by the way, here we have again off-topic question in the YouTube <laughs> chat from Kuba Zetek. Uh, for jingles specifically, how <laughs> is the weather? Are you still being cooked alive? Oh, it's not so bad today. Uh, but this is the thing. Anytime you mention in a video, that it's, it's 29 degrees outside. I can't take this. So, uh, straight away, you get into a pissing contest in the comments section <laughs> where everybody's trying to... Uh, we call it... There's an expression for it in the Royal Navy. They call it black catting. If you say you've got a black cat, Somebody else always says their cat is bigger and blacker. If you've <laughs> ever been, if you've ever been to Tenerife, somebody always says they've been to Eleven Reef, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the comment section of yesterday's video, of today's video, sorry, is lit. It's nothing whatsoever to do with the actual battle that took place in the water tanks. It's just everybody trying to one up each other over the temperature wherever it is they are. And well, some of them probably they, from Australia, right? Yeah, of course. You need to harden up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's one like, of the biggest comments. If you, if you want to hear an off-top story, right? I was in Australia, right? I was working in the parking lot throughout the day, and it was 43 degrees. And by the end of the day, the soles of my shoes had melted. <laughs> like, literally where before it was like a normal shoe, it was just literally, at the end of the day, a flat surface. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's hot. Stop complaining, mm -hmm. Jingles. <laughs> See, yeah. one thing I neglected to mention, or I kind of sort of covered it, is because British houses are not built to let the heat out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're built to keep the heat in, and it's twenty degrees, twenty nine degrees out there. It's thirty five degrees in here, even with the air conditioning on. So, yeah, I'm not designed for these kind of temperatures. It's kind of surprising <laughs> because I did kind of grow up in South Africa, but that was a really long time ago. I've had time to acclimate myself mm -hmm. back to the to the British weather. Okay, so shall we? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, submarines pretty useless. Let's uh, mm. go to the next question. Waiting for the question. There we go. Um, so this is from Wow's Hoia, who's asking, "How often was the Jingles beard worn by officers of the Royal Navy, and was it accepted or was it frowned upon by those in higher ranks?" Um, I suppose I'm probably the best placed person to answer this one. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I knew many illustrious sailors in my time in the Royal Navy who had beards that looked exactly or bigger than the beard that I sport in my World of Warships captain image, which I've, you know, trimmed down for the warm weather. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you have to fill in a request form, a request to discontinue shaving. You take that to the regulating staff on board, they're like Navy policemen, regulating petty officer or the master at arms, depending on the ship. Um, and he will... He will decide, or she these days, will decide for themselves whether or not they judge that you will be capable of growing a beard. They will then approve your request. You then have two weeks to grow an acceptable beard. You're not allowed to shave because the request is to discontinue shaving. You're not allowed to shave. After those two weeks, you go back to the master at arms and they will say yes or no. You know, because a lot of people, their beards just grow in patches and they look horrible and nasty. They're okay, yep, yeah, fine. From that point on, you're allowed to trim it. You know, you can give your neck a shave, something I actually need to do at the moment. Um, but you're not allowed to, and you, if you want to start shaving the beard, if you want to shave the beard off, you have to submit another request form. And but the very, very first person that I met in the Navy with a beard you can hide a badger in was actually the master at arms on board HMS Intrepid, uh, who was, a, I can't remember his name, but he was a legendary figure. Uh, everybody looked up when this guy walked at the office. You could see his beard arrived before he did. You had time to, you know, 
shut your screensaver off and make, make yourself look busy. But I met multiple people throughout the course of my career in the Navy who all had beards like that. Uh, and most of them seem to be regulating staff, Navy policemen, which is quite, <laughs> quite alarming. Um, one of them had a sort of side gig. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, there was a British TV show called uh, Bad Lads Army, Drachenfell. Do you remember that? Nope. Basically, they take a bunch of scumbags and they put them through uh, 1950s style British Army training. Uh, and that was done, at least the first season was filmed at Brown Down Camp, which is just around the corner from here in Gosford. And uh, all, all of the training that was done at Brown Down Camp, they would do a lot of counter terrorist training and so on. And there was one master at arms in particular uh, who had a beard you could hide a badger in, who used to have. Um, a, a fairly regular side gig playing Osama bin Laden <laughs> during counterinsurgency <laughs> training exercises at Brown Down Camp. So yes, it is absolutely a thing. It still is. You can grow a beard like this in the Navy. Uh, technically, the regulations still exist for you to grow your hair as long as you like as well. But practically, it never happens because the regulations which date back to the 1700s, if you have, if you have your hair longer than a certain regulation length, it has to be uh, tarred. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. You know, the, you know okay. those those navy uniforms. Sorry, I got this. Got to get this one in. Those those navy ra uh, ratings, junior ratings uniforms with the big blue collars. That mm -hmm. collar is to keep the tar off your uniform from your hair. So there you go. Okay. Well, well um, I think I did, this is well, this yeah. was one of my favorite uh, questions. I, I have a sure. question from the chat here, or rather, comment from K M Super Bismarck. My favorite bit in Midway is when the hero sank the captain and one of his aides supposedly stayed on and started the moon as the sank, ship sank with them. Uh, well, it was the captain and the admiral of the carrier division too. Uh, but, uh, well, they stayed on board, but whatever happened with them, uh, nobody really knows because here you stayed uh, on the surface for quite considerable time until the next morning. Because actually, yeah, she was scuttled by torpedoes one torpedo missed and the other had some weird sort of low order detonation or something. So she was very slowly flooding, which was quite lucky because there were still some about 50 crewmen on board that were in engine rooms. So the abandon ship order didn't get to them, which is kind of inconvenient. But they eventually made uh, their way up on the deck. They found that there was no one on the ship anymore. They didn't see the admiral and the captain. Uh, they were photographed by a Japanese scout plane in the morning, which resulted in the Yamamoto sending in a destroyer to take them off. Here you sank in the meantime. They got an, in a boat. Uh, they were picked up two weeks later by American airplane carrier, uh, seaplane carrier. Uh, but uh, the destroyer that was uh, sent for them had quite eventful day because uh, it was a attacked basically by every American plane in the area because it was attacked two times by flying fortresses from Midway. It was attacked by uh, the dive bombers from Enterprise and Hornet. It uh, escaped uh, with basically no damage, but uh, yeah, it, it was a very eventful day for the poor uh, little destroyer. Well, so so what, what you're saying is the destroyer just dodged. <laughs> yes, it, it just dodged very, very profusely. Excellent. Okay, um, before we... I, I see there's some more, more questions about the on topic, some of the off topic. We'll get to that in a little bit. Let's try and uh, get, go through a few more of our questions. Most of these are going to be more serious than uh, Jingle's beard questions, although I do enjoy those greatly. So the next question is from Nine Arid, and he's saying, asking, for the above water Navy, is it still a requirement for knowledge of knots to be skill tested or even taught? Good Absolutely, question. yes. I, I had to... Uh, when I joined the Navy, originally I was a radio operator. Um, and everybody during basic training is taught basic uh, rope work with knots. Things like how to tie uh, a bowline, a rolling hitch, and other things that I have completely forgotten in the intervening years because I never had to put it into practice. However, uh, for what were known as the operations branch, when I joined the Navy, and I think are now known as the warfare branch, or at least they were when I left the Navy, and they probably have a completely different title now, um, people who actually work on the upper deck with ropes and lines and cables, absolutely, definitely, 100% still are taught how to tie knots, all kinds of knots, and they still use them, if not on a daily basis, then at least on a weekly basis. I mean, if your ship's coming alongside, uh, or if a boat's coming alongside your ship, uh, you drop a ladder over the side, 
you have to strike the guardrail so that they can actually get up over the side of the ship. But then you immediately tie off a um, temporary guardrail using the knots that you were taught in training. Um, okay. So you can um, just can lift it and let them on board. Can you can you still do it, Jingles? Oh, no. <laughs> I I got seamanship training for about a week in 1989. Oh, I was about to say, I was going to just challenge you, but uh, you probably we, we would have had to mail you a rope or something. First. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, um, question number 11. Loading, loading, loading. There we go. It's also from Dine Errett. He submitted two good questions. Good, mm -hmm. good, good on you there. Uh, with the advent of modern communications and encrypted signals, why are the maritime signal flags still a common used signaling event? I can uh, take this one. Mm -hmm. But does anybody else want to? Well, you are the best authority on this, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, because you can't intercept the signal flag. You, even if you're using UHF and VHF radios, typically line of sight transmission ranges, that can still be intercepted. They don't have to know what you're saying, but they've heard you saying it, so they know they don't know where you are, but they know you're in that direction. Uh, you cannot intercept the signal hoist unless you're already in line of sight. And it, it also, they tend to mostly just be used for keeping station and formation. So for example, one ship will be the guide ship in the formation. Everybody else, their course is plotted on the guide. It will be a sort of what they call a sector screen drawn in a big circle with the guide in the middle and you have this sector. You must stay in that sector. This ship must stay in that sector around the guide. And when the guide makes a course change, they just raise a signal flag. Usually execute to follow. So you go, oh, give you time because the bridge crews and the uh, signal deck crews are constantly watching the guide amongst other things to see what signals are being raised. And you know, group turn to starboard to two zero degrees, execute. So everybody will acknowledge the, the signal, and then when it gets hauled down, that's when everybody turns. And you can do that without transmitting anything. It's completely secure, and it's completely safe. In fact, they still also use uh, Morse code flashing light using signaling lanterns. Again, um, because it's incredibly quick, it's incredibly secure, nobody can intercept it, you don't give your position away when you use it. So yes, they absolutely still do use them. How's, how's your Morse code jingles? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Used to be very good. Um, I was trained to touch type, where you'd sit there with your headphones on, listening to Morse code and typing it out at uh, 60 words a minute. But it's been a long time since I needed to do that. Yeah, it's impressive. Yeah, nice. But uh, this, this is actually another important point, because uh, especially with regards to the uh, movies that cover the, uh, the Battle of Midway, bo both of them, uh, they seem to... Uh, use voice radio a lot, but actually the way most of the messages were relayed from planes to carrier and back was Morse code and uh, usually very short signals, basically yeah. pre-recorded signals. So Yes, you have these things, they call them OPSIGs, operating signals. So for example, yeah. um, the famous one that everybody says is 5 by 5 from the movie Aliens, we're in the pipe, 5 by 5 5 by 5 means loud and clear. That's, that's literally what it means. Yeah. So when you, for example, were doing a radio check, you would send a signal that in Morse that just said int ZBZ or interrogative Zulu Bravo Zulu, uh, Zulu Bravo Zulu, which meant, how do you hear me? And they would come back with Zulu Bravo Zulu, sorry, Zulu Bravo Zulu, anything between one and five, uh, with one being weak and unreadable and five being loud and clear. So it, how long does it take? It's a three. It's a. It's a. It's two three figure cut groups. How long does it take you to send that in Morse code? What's your chances of being intercepted when you send them? And they still use them today, even over, uh, even over voice circuits. You'll see people saying interrogative Zulu, not you know radio check, radio check. How do you hit? They'll just say that because and and you don't need to speak English. Right? You can be German, French, Dutch, Italian, Aus Austrian. It doesn't matter. Everybody uses the same. Certainly within NATO, at least everybody uses the same opsigs. So they can communicate quickly and efficiently without all having to speak the same language. Yeah, and apart, uh, also in World War II, to be perfectly honest, voice radio was pretty awful at anything other than short range. And yeah, if you, if, as, as Jingles just pointed out, if you know what these codes mean, not only are they more secure, you can also relay information a heck of a lot faster. Uh, signals these days, the other use for signal flags I just thought I'd briefly bring up is um, again to do with language. It's a universal thing everyone at least for if you're a warship trying to communicate with merchant shipping you have no idea who's on board what language they speak 
but international signal flags are universal. So you can hoist a flag, and even if they are reading it in a completely different language, their response will be intelligible to you. And also, to be perfectly honest, on half of these uh, civilian vessels, they probably don't have a working radio most of the time anyway, so you don't, you wouldn't have any luck calling yeah. them over, over the radio. Okay, cool. Um, easy one. Um, oh, God, what, what was the number of the question? Anybody remember? Um, uh, no, not was really. that six? I can't remember. Seven, eight, uh, something Jingles. Oh, me again? Come on. No, but I mean, Jingles, that's not... Ah, that's the wrong one. So we we, we actually two only more pre-recorded ones, and then mm. we will, will be talking to chat. Mm. Actually, we're, we're also running out of time. Um, Medved M07 <sighs> is asking, what was the life like on a Canadian Corvette during the Atlantic battle? Absolutely bloody miserable. I mean, you <laughs> struggle to understand just how terrible life would have been. I mean, I don't know, but I have some experience of what it's like in the North Atlantic in a larger ship, and it's absolutely bloody terrible. <laughs> so I can believe that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I when I first joined the Navy, it was at the, at, the, at the back end of the Cold War. So the Royal Navy basically existed as an anti-submarine warfare force. So we were constantly patrolling what's called the Greenland, Ice, and UK Gap. So frigates, and not to be confused with World War II frigates, okay? The frigates that we served on were as big as heavy cruisers, or bigger than heavy cruisers for World War II. So a Type 22 broadsword class frigate, for example, displaces 5,300 tons. A flower class corvette that was used primarily for convoy escort duties in World War II displaces less than 1,000. So wearing one of these big old Type 22 frigates in a North Atlantic storm, not a particularly impressive North Atlantic storm. If you want to know what they look like, just Google North Atlantic storm and prepare to be horrified on YouTube. Um, and we're coming up over the crest of these waves. And occasionally I had the misfortune to be assigned to the bridge crew uh, as a tactical radio operator. And so, so I've got a grandstand view, one of the only half a dozen people on board at the time who would, of the ship going up over the crest of this wave then down into the trough and then the bridge disappearing underwater as we came up through the other side. And that's in a 5,300 ton, oh, damn, it's 5,300 ton frigate. Now you imagine doing that in a 950 ton Corvette. Everything was wet, everything was cold, didn't have an enclosed bridge. So, you know, you got very, very wet. Uh, it was impossible for the chef to cook anything other than maybe warm up some bully beef and make sure everybody had lots of hot sweet tea. So you're eating beef, bully beef, tin, tinned beef and crackers for weeks on end. And the Germans are trying to kill you. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I can recommend anyone who wants to get the real like impressions to read The Cruel Sea by Montserrat. Yes. Because yeah. that's that's it's a huge book and it's very, very gripping narrative of basically yes. yeah, corvette oh. duty in the Atlantic in World War II. There oh, yeah. are also... Oh, yeah, there are also some uh, very interesting pictures, like a uh, search for HMS, uh, HMCS Leamington on the anywhere on the internet. There is a very nice photograph of uh, the destroyer returning from uh, a convoy escort with basically the entire forecastle being one huge iceberg. I mean, I, I, I just can't imagine it. The, the worst experience I had um, in terms of like weather was when I was in, in the Philippines on one of those, you know, the Philippine Philippines, they have these really narrow boats with like some bamboo, like bamboo skewers, bamboo outriders to keep it from falling over. And we got caught in a storm. And I I didn't think I would make it back ever. And like in the middle, and this was in the Philippines, you know, like nice, calm, relaxed seas normally, right? But North Atlantic, I would be absolutely crapping my pants. Don't forget, if you're doing this in a Corvette during World War II, you're doing it for the entire war. Right, because the Battle of the Atlantic, <laughs> the biggest and longest battle ever fought. And you, you're going across the Atlantic one way. You, you're getting a couple of days in maybe Halifax and Nova Scotia or Norfolk, Virginia. And you spent, you're not really getting any time off because you have to repair all of the damage that you suffered on the way there and then stock up and then get ready to escort another group going the other way. Everybody got, I mean, I don't want to belittle the, 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 the suffering and the sacrifice of the merchant crew. But they had it easy compared to the escort crews. 
who were doing it constantly and would only, I mean, the, the, the merchant would get like a day's leave for every two weeks they spent at sea. Technically, the Navy were earning leave as well. They had an annual leave entitlement, but whether they could be spared to take it or not, um, you might be lucky and get sent away to take all of your outstanding leave, like a couple of weeks when the ship was in a refit. But other than that, forget it. It was just constant over mm. and over and you did it for years. So no thank you. Yeah. I I've 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 experienced something close to that in the I went on a, a whale watching expedition when I was uh, on holiday in Iceland and the little whale watching boat was a converted tugboat, so not the most stable of vessels when it comes oh. to high seas. Um and yeah, a storm blew in coming And then in the Germans on, came? It, <laughs> that would have been a relief, to be honest, because um, the, they seem to have forgotten that they had an English family on board. So this weird announcement in Icelandic came over the intercom, which apparently translated to "There's really rough seas coming. Please get off of the out of the sort of the crow's nest viewing area they had at the top of the mast." So all the Icelandic people disappeared, and there's little me left stuck up there, wondering where the heck everybody has gone. Shortly before the boat starts doing this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, then you're like, I'm looking over the edge. It's like, I can see straight down into the ocean. Ping! Now I can see straight up into the sky. Now I'm hanging off the handrail. And now I'm being slammed into the into the side. And can I get down the ladder? No, I'm holding onto this handrail because the next thing I'm going to be shot like a trebuchet bolt into the, into the uh, Atlantics. And it was fun for 15, 20 minutes until I got back into Reykjavik, Reykjavik Harbor. But one, I wasn't getting wet too much. And two... 20 minutes try doing that in the middle of the north atlantic for three or four days plus well, this, in the middle yeah. of a storm <laughs> this actually bring brought up an episode from i think it was the battle of the eastern solomons when uh, enterprises uh, air search radar got uh, knocked out by a splinter damage uh, so the officer in charge of the radar went on the mast to fix it but uh, uh, once he fixed it before he could climb down the operator's cell, well, it's online, so they turned the engine that turned the radar antenna around on. So he was kind of stuck there and just as a, a next wave of air raid was incoming. So basically he was hanging on, on the antenna right above uh, the AA guns. He got off quite uh, deaf for a few days because, well, <laughs> before anyone noticed that, oh, he, that, that guy wasn't supposed to be there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one of our regulars on YouTube, Lee Benson, says he did the North Atlantic crossing in a 32 foot sailboat. Oh. So. That must have been interesting. <laughs> Jingles is like, why would you do <laughs> this? <laughs> How many deities did he appease before he made this crossing? Uh, like uh, it's, the, 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 yeah, the, the sea can be a dangerous and yeah. crazy place. Let's uh, have a look at the last question for the day. Mm -hmm. um, well, last pre-recorded. Yes. <laughs> so, oh God. Oh, this is the long <laughs> one. So it's the essay. I'll be back. Calm, calm down, gentlemen. I'm going to read this out. Right. So, Gamers Tank is asking. First, I want to give a shout out to Drakinifil and the Lord of the Salt Mine. I am a high school history teacher and completely dreadful Lord of Warships player from Georgia. <laughs> I've been to the Yorktown at Patriots Point several times when I was in the Scouts. We used to spend the weekend on the ship. Me and my brother would sneak off to restricted parts of the ship or spend numerous hours in the 40mm Bofors AA mount they had in the hangar. My question concerns the Yorktown. During the battle, the first attack of the Yorktown, I seem to remember, scored two... Wait. Suffered. Uh, sorry. During the battle, the first attack of the Yorktown, I seem to remember, scored two torpedo heads. The Japanese reported it to be dead in the water and on fire. Yorktown's crew were able to get two of the boilers lit, extinguish the fire, and was making around 23 knots when the second attack approached. During the second attack, a Japanese plane that was coming down decided to fly into Yorktown. So I guess uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to first confirm that a Japanese plane did kamikaze into the Yorktown. My question is if this uh, uh, is if this is correct. Was this action the first step towards the use of such a, such a tactic? Is there any record of this action being mentioned in the justification of kamikaze attacks? On another note, if any of you have been to Patriots Point, where the Yorktown is anchored, the USS Clamagor is anchored there as well. This is one of the few remaining World War II submarines left in the world. 
Fortunately, it's currently in really bad shape. People have been talking about scuttling her and making her a reef. I've always enjoyed taking the tour of that submarine every time I went there. It is truly scary how small that sub is. It becomes truly terrifying when you add the fact that if you were in that thing in World War II, your torpedoes would not detonate when they hit a target because failure is like onions. <laughs> so that was a very, very long question. Thank you, Gamers Tank. Next time, do me a favor. Like, sentence? Question mark. Or question. But yeah. Um, comments, gentlemen? Uh, that wasn't. You chose a that, by the way. Attack. We did, yeah, yeah. yes, because we knew we wanted to look forward to listening to you read it. <laughs> um, that wasn't technically a kamikaze attack. It wasn't a tactical decision. Uh, there was no doctrine that that's how you're going to employ your aircraft. That was a Japanese pilot who either knew he'd been hit, knew he was going down and decided to attempt to take the ship out with him or was already dead at the controls and or couldn't control the aircraft. But yes, it did hit the Yorktown. Um, but I think you'd really have to struggle to try to claim that as the first recorded kamikaze yeah. attack. Yeah. It, it, you've got, it was, you've got to it was an accident. Yeah, you've got to remember this is we're talking mid 42. The first proper doctrinal kamikaze attacks you don't see till the Battle of Leyte Gulf which is two years and a lot of sunken ships down the line. Um, the, the thing is, that there are records of aircraft on, well, both sides of the Pacific War and also in other theatres of World War II, individually choosing to fly their aircraft either at or into enemy ships, it's especially when they're, they realise they're too badly damaged because, hey, if you're... If your plane's been shot apart, you're on fire and you're right over an enemy ship, you're probably going to die on impact with the water anyway if you're out, almost out of control. So you might as well try and make it count for something. So there are plenty of records of US aircraft doing it, Japanese aircraft doing it, German, Italian, British aircraft doing it. Um, it did happen all over the place, but as Jingle said, it's not a, it's not a specific kamikaze attack, as in yes. the pilot deliberately went out there to, to commit suicide. Yeah, for example, in the during the Guadalcanal campaign, the USS San Francisco was hit by a damaged plane. Uh, USS Hornet was hit also, and I believe one of the Japanese cruisers was uh, hit by a uh, out of control uh, American dive bomber. So hmm. that's uh, yeah, it it used to happen sporadically. It hmm. just uh, in uh, 1944, the Japanese high command decided that they might try to have it intentional. Yeah, I can't remember the exact details, but I think at some point either a B-25 or a B-17 tried to crash into a Kagi. Um, uh, B-26. Uh, there were oh, yeah. four... How four do B you guys remember all of this? <laughs> I'm just sitting here like, oh, just, uh, okay, fine. Uh, actually, there were, there were two incidents regarding a Kagi with the B-26s because mm. one... Uh, like, again, it's questionable. Was it out of control? Was it intentional attempt to fly into Akagi or was it just attempt to get out of the situation because actually that's like that, that was anyway the shortest way for the plane to go if it wanted to escape but can't, it, we, uh, can't missed... we just can't we just call the pilot and ask <laughs> uh, unfortunately not but uh, the, the plane uh, missed Akagi's bridge uh, very closely and then it was followed by another B26 that was trying to get away that actually got away even though in uh, no condition to fly subsequently after it landed on Midway. Uh, but that plane strafed the Akagi's flight deck with <laughs> machine guns. So, like, <coughs> th that's also one of the things that uh, you have to remember for the Battle mm -hmm. of Midway for Nagumo's conditions, because for one, he was subjected to a lot of constant attacks, because basically Akagi was one of the prime targets. And the other thing is he his command facilities were atrocious because basically Akagi didn't have a flag bridge it had only the ship's bridge which was very cramped was already full of the ship's officers who had their jobs there and in that little space Nagumo had to be squeezed in with his staff as well and they had to basically make uh, make everything work so that they don't hinder the ship's staff the ship's staff again that they don't hinder the admiral so that was also a lot, uh, a large part of uh, the inconvenience because, like, you cannot really work effectively in such environment. You know, it, it, it just occurred to me that we're, we're pro approaching the end of the stream now, and we haven't yet once, which is surprising considering we've mostly been talking about Midway and the myths surrounding mm. Midway, yeah. but we haven't yet once mentioned Kushida Mitsuo. <laughs> uh, we did. 
did we? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, early on. But uh, but yeah, he. Uh, we should probably mention him more because <coughs> he uh, left his mark on the record of the battle, <laughs> and more than one spot. <laughs> yes. So for years, uh, Fushida Mitsuo was the only primary Japanese source on what happened on the Japanese side during the Battle of Midway, and because he wrote his memoirs, and he was one of the, I think he was the only. Japanese senior Japanese officer, relatively senior, uh, who survived the battle, who actually wrote about it. Nobody else would talk about it. And so for decades, his account was treated as gospel. Not so much in Japan, where relatively soon afterwards, he was outed as basically being completely full of shit, um, either outright lying in order to make himself look good or being disingenuous with the truth. And yet, Western historians, for decades after he'd been categorically proven to be an unreliable source in Japan, Western historians, because it, it just became fact, because he was the primary source, and everybody quoted him, and everything, everything, you know, even completely, um, what's the right word, respectable historians, um, had no option other than to read what Fushida had written because he was the only primary Japanese source available. And so, of course, distinguished Western historians are, are quoting this guy now. And other people are now quoting those distinguished Western historians when they're writing their own accounts. So it became what Fushida said became true. Meanwhile, in Japan, they're all going, why do people still believe this guy? And it wasn't until relatively recently um, in the West that Fushida's account, which in large part led to some of the myths arising around about midway um but it wasn't until relatively recently like the very early 21st century when western historians started to realize hang on we've been taken for a ride here this guy's full of crap and started actually going to the japanese documentary evidence and seeing well actually no uh japanese well, carriers uh... decks weren't covered in strike aircraft at the time it would have been technically impossible for that to have happened um, well, they, they, they describe how they approached the Japanese historians with like very careful questions, afraid to touch the icon, mm. and the Japanese histori historians' answer was like, wait, wait, anyone still believes this guy? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's, uh, to be honest, it's something you see, I mean, Vishida especially with Midway, but you see this actually across the board throughout almost almost all the campaigns of World War II on all sides. Um these narratives have been demolished at different times, in some cases earlier than, than Fushida's. In some cases, there are probably still a few that we might find out in a few years down the line that, that we've all got wrong. But yeah, it, this, it, it's one of those important questions. Isn't it? if, if you have a single person who was there and they're writing their account, that may be the only source you think you've got, but you can't necessarily take what they say without question. And, and just assume that it's correct. I mean, yeah, it's, the, the classic example is the land war in, in well, in Europe. If you read all the, all the uh, German generals' books, it's all Hitler's fault. Yep. <laughs> and that was the narrative for years. But it turns out, pro well, the war might have been Hitler's fault, but the specific tactical decisions <laughs> probably weren't so much. And even, even when you do things like you look at the Bismarck, there's one or two dominant accounts from survivors of the Bismarck who wrote their accounts and by and large everyone quotes them and everyone um, says yeah this is what happened I happen to have been able to be friends with another survivor of the Bismarck who didn't write a book but he gave a very different account of certain engagements and certain reasons why certain things happens and well unfortunately now he's no longer with us but if he was and if he had put those those into writing we would have had potentially let's say with with that we would have had several relatively different ideas about what went on at certain key points so this is what i say fushida is a good example of a, a very much delayed case of uh, finding out what actually happened but i i do suspect that there is still quite a few other similar situations out there especially yeah. with highly emotive subjects like midway or bismarck or probably even late a 
Yeah, but so I guess another, the chance of us actually getting 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 to get to the bottom of it is getting a smaller and smaller less. as the time goes on. Yes. Yeah. I want to add uh, address one really quick question from Indrahim, mm. and I've seen a few people say this as well. Um, he's saying, "Can we get more of this armchair admirals? It is fun and more educational than expected, <laughs> even though it includes jingles." <laughs> I, I added that. That's part. a bit harsh. <laughs> no, I added that was a joke. Um, maybe upload it to YouTube as well. So um, I wanted to just. Uh, tell you all right this is now going to be a recurring thing we're going to do this on the last friday of every month so then we're going to have one another one in about a month uh, we are also live streaming this to youtube at the same time so you can of course uh, go and watch it um, afterwards and i believe some of it uh, will also be published on uh, maybe jingles maybe trick and Phil's channel so uh, you can look forward to that mm -hmm. sorry continue please I was going to say another example of the sort of thing that we're talking about is, of course, Belton Cooper's infamous death trap. Oh, oh, because, oh, oh. Yeah. Sherman's a terrible tank. <laughs> yes. They burst into flames the second you even look at them. Um, and, of course, everybody's, oh, yeah, Sherman's a bad thing. Actually, uh, it, questions were raised in Congress about the Shermans and their terrible unreliability. Mm. Nothing could have been further from the truth because Belton Cooper uh, was an ordnance officer whose job was to recover damaged tanks. So most of the time, the only Shermans he saw had been shot at, knocked out, and had burned for all kinds of reasons. Not because they were especially uh, susceptible to burning when shot at, but because America was advancing and Germany was retreating. And Germany knew that if they wanted to deny those tanks to the Americans, they had to shoot them and shoot them and shoot them, not until they were knocked out, but until they started burning, so the Americans couldn't recover them and salvage them, which they were very, very good at doing. So it's unsurprising that Belton Cooper's majority of experience with Sherman tanks was looking at burnt out wrecks. And of course, he then wrote his book, um, which unfortunately I myself read, thought, well, this guy's a primary source. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and then went on to repeat the bollocks that he was writing in the book. I, 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 him because that was his experience, but his experience isn't necessarily going to tell you the whole story. You have to look yeah. at it in context. Fun story. Up until this moment, Jingles, I was also under the impression the Shermans were terrible and always caught fire. And you know why? Because of a video I saw on your channel. That's how it goes. Yeah. And, I, and I mean, to be honest, it's it's not just um, people's deliberately biased accounts or incidentally biased accounts, as you say, because that might be what they personally have experienced, but doesn't reflect the whole reality. It can also be, this is why you always have to be careful and always willing to dig deeper when it comes to doing this kind of historical research because it can even be even unintentionally selectively interpreting the data i remember there was a very good example of weirdly enough napoleonic era uh, cavalry swords where everyone's going oh yes well we can see from the from the fact that loads of people ended up in field hospitals with wounds from this type of sword and very very few ended up in the hospital with wounds from this type of sword well clearly this one must have been superior and it's Wasn't only it when was it because the other side of sword, the other the other type of sword, was killing the more people? Exactly. Yes. yes. Exactly. Everyone was like, "Oh, well, these ones died. <laughs> this is a, that, that 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 it turns it completely on its head." But you're using the data that's there; it's accurate data. You're just not interpreting it correctly. You're not looking at it in its in its correct context. Uh, um, another fun uh, example. Again, getting back to Midway, for example. Again, uh, a lot of the Western narrative about the battle was formed by basically projecting uh, the idea that the Japanese aircraft carriers worked the same way as the Americans did. Mm -hmm. And that that wasn't so at all, because the doctrines were completely different. And actually, uh, just a quick mention, because I promised on the forum <laughs> mm -hmm. of the of the doctrinal, doctrinal differences, that, for example, the Japanese doctrine allowed uh, the Japanese carriers to launch very quickly balanced strike groups that were basically modular. They were just uh, like, you have one carrier division, okay, you have six carriers, no, but no problem, you still use the same uh, building blocks and you send them out and you have a nicely balanced strike. But on the other hand, the, the downside of this that was that the doctrine was very rigid and the commanders were basically loath to violate it to, for example, send just dive bombers or just torpedo bombers because that's that was basically completely against everything that the entire system was built around on the other hand the american doctrine in the battle was basically lack of doctrine let's say because like the americans had some basic building blocks but they didn't go into the details like that uh, if two carriers are operating together they should try to launch the strikes together and synchronize them so basically 
Enterprise and Hornet were uh, launching, let's say, very ineffectively, where like uh, it's uh, the launch took them like one hour and a half in the case of Hornet, which was basically disaster. Uh, and uh, that also lit did lead, on the other hand, to the American flight groups to be scattered all over the place and in the end converging on the Japanese carriers. But basically, the in, in the American case, there was a lack of clear doctrine and uh, it didn't uh, it took basically until 1943 until the all these matters were settled so that's also another aspect that basically at midway the Japanese pilots were or the, generally the Japanese carriers were in their prime they were by that time the finest like offensive instrument uh, on the seas at the time but on the other hand uh, that did lead them to some pitfalls so quite often like the question like why didn't Nagumo or why didn't uh, Fletcher do this 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 the que the answer is because like that wasn't in the toolbox and uh, you cannot really write a new toolbox in the middle of the battle because that usually ends up uh, very badly mm. uh, I, I can't help but notice in the background uh, Luke you've got pictures of aircraft carriers that seem to be on fire <laughs> yes. 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 No, I. I didn't a... think. I didn't think a carrier was allowed to burn for longer than three seconds before the fires all well, well, you have to. Themselves. You have to hit Thank the print chickens. screen just at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is the thing. It's. It's. When it comes to doctrine, so many major disasters, navally and militarily generally, have come out of people assuming they know what the enemy's doctrine is, or worse, assuming that the enemy will follow their own doctrine. This cardinal mistake to make in any kind of military engagement and and secondly the inability to adapt and overcome you you have i mean the, i've made this point before you have officers who follow the letter of their orders and officers who follow the spirit of their orders an officer who follows the letter of his orders will very rarely ever find himself in front of a court-martial but he's also very unlikely to find himself in front of uh, a panel that's about to award him a medal or a baronessy if you're in the uk um <laughs> Someone who follows the spirit of their orders, but is willing to adapt on the fly to evolving situations and actually think for themselves, that's where you actually get your big decisive victories. And, oh. and, and even at Midway, you see this where the US pilot officers, they take decisions on the fly. They see a thing, they follow a thing. They, they, they see a target, oh, this target's, I should be attacking this target, but this target's already being attacked. I'll go and attack this one instead. Yeah. They're changing what they what their orders are on the fly. They're following the spirit of the intention, which has hurt the Japanese, and they get a victory out of it. Even though there there was probably that was the biggest stroke of luck of the battle, uh, because when the Enterprise dive bombers went into attack, the uh, commander of the flight group, because he was a mm. former fighter pilot and wasn't really that well versed in the dive bomber doctrine. He actually violated the doctrine because that was that the first squadron should attack the further away target and the second squadron mm -hmm. should attack the closer target. He dove on the closer target while the second squadron was attacking according to the doctrine, so on the closer target, which did lead to Kaga getting basically <laughs> blasted by at least five direct hits, but yeah. most likely more because like there was no one mm. left to count because like the ship was just demolished basically from from a boat to the center stern, yeah. So, yeah. But, on contrast, uh, if you look at if you look at the Japanese war games prior to Midway, where one Japanese officer who was playing the part of the Americans during the war games had the temerity to try to do something that they hadn't planned for and attack from well, I can't remember the exact details of what it was he did, but it wasn't planned for in the war games. And actually inflicted a defeat on uh Yamamoto and Fushida's force. And he was remonstrated for it, told to not yep. do that again, <laughs> go back and do what you were told to do instead. Exactly. Yeah, that, that was actually that was an interesting moment because he basically what he did is he did not stick to the perceived plan. He sent his carriers forward very aggressively and used Midway as a cover to approach from the south. And actually, even though he was remonstrated and stuff, it seems that the Nagumo actually did take this lesson on board because that's why he dedicated two extra planes to search to the south of Midway. Yeah. Unfortunately, the enemy was completely the opposite direction, but well. 
so so um, a gentleman chat um assorted mm -hmm. uh, beings um I, I do have to apologize for this interrupting this conversation but i believe that our allotted time for the stream has come to an end which normally wouldn't matter oh. but uh i'm hungry yeah, <laughs> and so is jingles and maybe other people uh, but uh no i, I want to say thank you very much for you guys for joining us uh today's stream both uh, Juke and Phil and jingles um i for one I thought it was very fun and um i hope you guys in chat had fun with us today as well like i said we are going to be doing this on every last friday of the month going forward um yep. would you guys uh, what's what's the topic for next next month's stream have you decided I have no already? idea i don't think we've picked one yet um uh, yeah, I, I think we did pick but uh, i forgot what but, was uh, it guadalcanal no, not scrolls. yet. Not yet. Frantically scrolls. Yes. Uh, no, but uh, the, this is one thing uh, about the topics. Basically, we want to always, uh, for the monthly stream, pick up one of the topics that was happening in that month. So that's why yeah. now we have uh, now we are focusing on midway. Uh, I saw questions for Bismarck and for other important battles. We will eventually get to them, but uh, we are always trying to basically stick with the anniversaries. So. Yeah. Oh, uh, there you go, J J July. I think, I think we were still in the process of tossing a coin between Operation yes. Catapult and PQ Seventeen. <laughs> yes, because th there's usually several very like interesting uh, topics for the f for yes. each month. So. Operation Catapult. A bunch of Brits mm. sitting around talking about the British shooting up French ships. That's never going to go badly, <laughs> is it? Well, well, if we manage to get uh, someone French to join in. Okay. Well, then, even um, better. <laughs> so, so um, I would like to. I'm going to quickly spam it here, right? If you don't yet follow a Drakkin Nafel on YouTube, um, do yourself a favor. Go over there and and follow him. And the same goes for, of course, the mightiest of the jingles. Whichever um, way he is on the stream, I don't know. The, 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 I, don't, I don't know right now either. But the mighty jingles also does excellent things. Um, he also does like tank stuff. But you know, like you can skip over those videos to get to the juicy ship videos. Mm -hmm. um, but no, go follow these fine gentlemen. Um, and watch Definitely, the content. there's a lot of it, um, and it's it's very good. From my side, I'm going to say now, thank you very much. I'm going to say goodbye um, to Jingles and Trick NFL. So yes. um, I, I hope you had fun and we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon and we'll decide if, whether or not PQ 14 or 17 or Catapult will be the, the choice. If you guys have an opinion on which of the two you would like to see, <laughs> drop um, us a comment in the forum. Drop a comment in the forum or drop I can't a comment on YouTube guess videos. How that's going to go. You know, like, l l let us know what you want, because ultimately we're doing this for you. Um, and remember, if you want to have one of your questions answered in detail, um, pay attention to the board publication. It will usually come out a week before the stream um, and go leave your question in, in the formal link there. Yes. Yeah. So goodbye, guys. I'm just going to say goodbye. And then Taki and me are going to mm -hmm. say goodbye. And then we're actually going to go off. So, so bye. You can't see me, right? But you, you, in the future, you can go back to the VOD. You can okay. imagine. Anyway. We, can, we can see you. <laughs> No, they can't see me. Ah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, bye. Do you bye want to say anything thanks before for you go? joining? Before I push the button to make you go away? No, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. Imagination failure at the last second. You got me. See you next month. <laughs> yeah, that'll do. <laughs> okay. What, what what he said. What he said. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. So chat, um, just us now, um, but actually there's not much to talk about. It's it's late, um, we are getting tired and hungry. Guys, by the way, I see they're still here, right on my screen. You guys can hang up now and go if you want. You can stay, it's up to you. Um, uh, I do have to give a little disclaimer. I forgot to push the recording button because you guys didn't remind me as you as you told me. So uh, some of, I, 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 I remember it's, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Um, so chat, um, for us, um, there will be another stream happening in one hour and 45 minutes. Our American um, counterparts will be streaming. So if you want some more warships action on the official channel, stick around. They're going to be uh, going to, you know, sync chips with the boat game. Um, and we are going to be back live next week, um, same time as usual, Thursday, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock Central European Summertime, and I hope to see you there. Taki, do you have any last words? Uh, well, uh, this stream has been fun. I really uh, liked talking with the esteemed gentleman about history. I hope it was as much fun for the audience. And, uh, well, I'm looking forward to the next installment, and obviously I'm looking forward to some regular game streams in the meantime with uh, our German twins. 
summer yes. is coming, but the streams are still here. <laughs> That's true. Um, we are, of course, going to rate one of our community contributors. I want to tell him so that you guys can't warn him. Um, I won't tell you who it is, but he's excellent. Um, and uh, you should definitely follow his channel because he, he makes really good worship content. And he's a nice guy. Um, yeah, so that's also it for me. Um, hope you had fun. If you did, please tell us on the forums. Leave us some feedback. And um, yeah, see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>